going from San Francisco to Miami. It's like going from third world to first. SF and Miami are kind of like peaks into the future. So you have like the Florida man trope, but guess what? Florida man has high speed rail. Florida man can afford a house to raise a family in. Florida man has law and order. California man, not so much. You literally went to Ukraine. A colleague of mine, he's like, hey, why don't, why don't we go? I'm like, okay, fine, I'll ride with you. He ended up eventually interviewing Zelensky. I had to go do a podcast of all things. So I had to, <laughs> I had to go do Rogan. And Joe Rogan pulls you out of a I know, war zone. Yeah. I spent all my time thinking about Bitcoin. It is probably the most American ethos, like based technology yeah. that we have. If there is a crypto century, America should dominate it because it's like the most American thing ever. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Antonio here with me. Uh, I thought a great place to start this conversation. Uh, you recently came to Miami, which you've done many, many times before, and you took a photo. And it's a guy with a American flag draped over him. Uh, and he seems to be walking kind of away. Yeah. And the tweet was like, hey, there was no English spoken, but these people obviously appreciate the freedoms that are afforded them in uh, the United States. And they seem to be incredibly happy to now be in Miami in the United States. What was the significance of that to you? Like, why did you, one, notice it, and two, think that, hey, look, if I share this, like, it might uh, start a conversation? Yeah, so I do come to Miami a lot, and I was actually raised here, so I started, I started coming here pretty early. But yeah, so I just came into the airport. Miami airport is always fascinating, because Miami is fascinating, right? And so it's just the amount of people, and God knows what else that flows through Miami is just incredible. So I, I get off, and it was like late on a Saturday, so it was pretty quiet. And I see this sort of family ambling through, and there's a number of American flags like the one behind you. The guy's kind of wearing it almost like a shawl. There's a number of balloons. There's a sort of a celebratory atmosphere. I'm like, what is going on? And I sort of like follow along, kind of eavesdrop a little bit. It's like fresh off the island, very, you know, Cuban, common Cuban accent. And I, I think they had just arrived and, you know, basically they had gotten out somehow. That's a lot of the balloons said welcome. And, uh, you know, as you know, Miami's, it, it's interesting because, of course, it's, it's, it's this weird Venn diagram intersection between like Anglo-America and Latin America. And yet it is super patriotic. You see American flags everywhere. And, uh, yeah, I think it's people that just gotten from Cuba and, uh, you know, they're starting their new life in America. When a lot of, let's call it the tech and finance industry started to rediscover Miami, which, you know, people had uh, in other generations known about Florida yeah. in general. Yeah. Uh, but over the last two, three years, a lot of people moved here. A lot of people started to visit more often. Uh, one of the things they always talk about is like, hey, this doesn't feel like America. And they're right. talking specifically about language, about culture, yeah. about kind of uh, even the way that people act, the, the thoughts that they have. Uh, how important is it for the United States still to have these pockets of uh, areas where like it is the melting pot of so many different cultures. So I agree with that. On one hand, it doesn't feel American. On the other hand, it's like the most American city in America, in my opinion, right? Um, it's funny. I, so I was raised here. I lived until I was 18. And Miami in the 80s and 90s was very different than what you see today. In some ways, it was similar. In some ways, it was very different. But I remember I, thinking, oh, I, I, went, I went to the United States for college, right? <laughs> I went to school in the Midwest. And it's finally when I got there, I realized, man, I was not raised in the United States of America. <laughs> like, heartland America is very different than Miami. A lot of different cultural assumptions. But on the other hand, there's something so American about Miami, right? Mm -hmm. Like, no one cares where you're from. There's like a super strong hustle culture. I mean, talk about diversity. Here you have real diversity. So yesterday, long story, I was here for like a political conference that I'm doing a thing on. And um, I, I go, I'm in Aventura, which is a very Jewish part of Miami. And I go to a Judaica store because I was buying some stuff. And then I, I go to a, a kosher pita place. And the woman greets me in Argentinian Spanish. <laughs> right? And I, there were Latin American Jews that ran a, a kosher falafel place in Miami. And it's just this constant weird mix mm -hmm. of anything, of everything, right, happening. And, you know, it's very business oriented, right, as you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, aesthetically, it feels non-American in that, you know, good luck getting by without Spanish. But on the other hand, it is so American. Yeah. But it, it's just capitalism, right? It's, like capitalism yeah. is the DNA that runs through this entire place. And it feels right. uh, similar to like maybe when I was growing up, people were like, uh, oh, get to New York, uh, Wall Street, like th that whole world uh, to some degree was aspirational, but it was unreachable. Whereas it feels like here, this whole like hustle culture or whatever, uh, no, man, it's it's not about like, how do I create an asset management firm? It's like, I literally right. might go start a car wash. I might start a restaurant. I might start, you know, whatever. But like, there is a path to the quote unquote American dream. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, and I have to say, I think that hustle culture probably came. So my parents were Cuban exiles who came uh, when they were teens. I, I was born in the United States, but they came right after the revolution in the 60s, as many did. My father walked out of um, what's now called Freedom Tower, which you've probably seen, which is the, this old kind of ornate. It now looks dwarfed by the other buildings in Miami, but it was the original skyscraper in Miami. And he walked out of there, what was then the Cuban Refugee Center, which is now a museum to the Cuban exiles. And, uh, you know, he, as he would often remind me, he walked in here with three things in his pocket, a, um, a bus ticket to Chicago, a Spanish English dictionary and a plastic safety razor. That's it. That's what he came to the United States with. And, uh, you know, he, he worked in real estate, which is like a whole thing here. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's very much that hustle culture, that build, that get ahead, um, 
that the city has just had for decades. Yeah. Did he talk about Cuba at all growing oh, up? Oh, yeah, of course. Or like, of course. like uh, I, I think a lot about, so a family comes here and uh, they're kids, so they're first generation American, but uh, obviously they have a very different perspective of uh, what America is, what it means, the significance of it, the whole idea of like draping a flag over yourself walking through the airport. Uh, there are parts of the country who would call you racist. Right. For, for the Maybe. flag kind of becoming this like symbol in some people's eyes. On the other hand, it is a symbol of freedom and, and it's a single physical item that frankly has no thoughts. Has, you know, it's not sentient being. It's right. just being used in these different ways. Like what was it like growing up with Cuban exile parents? Yeah. I mean, somewhat less so now, because, again, Miami's become so cosmopolitan that there's lots of different influences that you see here. But back in the I mean, the Cuban part of Miami very much feels like this weird American suburban reboot of like pre-revolutionary Cuba. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the weird sort of almost contradictions of, of the Cuban exile experience is on the one hand, they're super patriotic, um, often tend to vote right of center. Uh, but on the other hand, they absolutely maintain in the most like shameless way their Cuban identity. So I, I went to Belen Jesuit, which is a prep school, which was the same high school that Fidel Castro went to. When he kicked out the Catholic priest, when he took power, they came to Miami and they set up the exact same school and it became exact same thing that it was in Cuba, which was the sort of, you know, whatever, a, a very conservative Catholic school. Um, and, and the same networks, the, the same families are often here as they are on the other side. And so they re they recreated in many ways pre-revolutionary Cubes, and then they've maintained a live, like they will just shamelessly expect you to drink Cuban coffee like Starbucks. What are you talking about? Of course not. Like this is just the way the world works. There's like everything is suffused by Latin American culture, American business culture and rule of law, and this is the way the world works. Um, but on the other hand, American flags everywhere, um, and they definitely don't have the sort of I think what you're getting at is the sort of fashionable um, sort of self-loathing or almost questioning of the meaning of America it doesn't have any play here because, again, here they, act, they, they actually know what the alternative is. The alternative is Cuba. The, the alternative is Venezuela. The alternative is all sorts of, you know, a world of pain that they left behind. And to and to them, this place seems magnificent. Yeah. One of the things I've heard people in different ways say over and over again is like uh, America seems to want to experiment and uh we don't need to do that. Like we, we've already seen how those experiments run. And so like, this is the best any human uh, group of people has figured out so far. Like, let's keep riding this wave. Um, but what was the big difference when you went to the Midwest? Like that's fascinating to have <laughs> Cuban exile parents grow up in Miami and then uh, you go to the Midwest, like are yeah. you just lost? Well, it was, it was weird. Well, it was, it was probably a mistake in the end for other reasons, but it, it was weird in the sense that my parents went to the Midwest. So the, the way the exile thing worked, if you had family here, um, you'd be sent to wherever your family was. So my, mm -hmm. my, both my parents were sent to Indiana and Illinois, and then they eventually ended up going to UIUC, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. So in their mind, like regular America was like frozen in amber. It was like post Eisenhower Mad Men 1960s America, where you went to like a Midwestern state school and everything was fine and America just functioned that way. And that was just like the image they had of America. Of course, <laughs> after after college, they went to California in the 70s. So like they experienced some of great, but then they came here and that's it. That's the image that's stuck in their head. So to them, going to a big state school in the Midwest is just what one did. Mm -hmm. Of course, in reality, it's not kind of the case anymore. Um, but yeah, no, I, it was, you know, it was one of these rural college town type things. Uh, dated a local girl who was raised on a farm. I mean, the, the full, the full picture, the, the full sitcom, right? Um, the full Netflix show. Um, I don't know. It was just, yeah, it was wild. It was a little, it was, it was different. And then I, and then I went to California and again, I was still kind of a Miami boy and that I didn't understand, you know, California has a lot of Hispanic culture as well, but it's a very different, it's a very different interaction than it is in Miami. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a learning experience. I mean, Again, Miami was just very different. It was very, it was much more provincial. I mean, this is also pre-internet, right? If you want to read the New York Times, like you have to find a copy and buy it; otherwise, you wouldn't get it. Um, and so, yeah, in many ways, I lived. I I did lead a sheltered life until yeah. until later. Well, it, it's interesting because uh, when I was in Silicon Valley, I worked with a number of people who had family in Miami. Uh, one person, I'm thinking in particular, uh, is Venezuelan. You know, full Venezuelan experience uh, has friends who uh, are not so well liked in the country by the uh, existing political regime. Um, and I remember saying to him at some point, like, "Yeah." I Think I'm going to move to Miami, and he was like, "Why would you ever do that?" Right? Because he was just like that. Like everyone who gets there then wants to leave. It's heat. Yeah. It's this. It's it's yeah. whatever. Uh, and so it does feel like there's almost this rediscovering of some of this. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, to some degree, but it also pits it. And I've seen you talk about this before, uh, where. Florida and California seem to be headed in two different directions yeah. and like <laughs> highlighting two different futures. Yeah. Like w when you analyze those two things, like how do you break that down? So for starters, I think your Venezuelan friends thing is, is a very common experience. I had the same experience when like Delian did his tweet and everyone got excited about Miami. Like I, had, I hadn't been back very often, to be honest. And again, Miami used to be 
somewhat provincial and a little backwatery. Um, I mean, cosmopolitan in its own way, but also like not part of like the New York SF continuum. No, but nobody who was ambitious, like super ambitious would stick around. Mm -hmm. Um, it was usually your more normal friends who stuck around everyone else left. So, but that's, that has radically changed, right? Just, yeah. I mean, I just came from Panther Coffee in Wynwood, which Wynwood used to be kind of a ghetto, by the way, was not a nice place to live at all. And there's some like somebody yammering in German next to me at this like third wave coffee place that did not exist (laughs) 15, 20 years ago, right? It was impossible for that to exist. Um, but yeah, in terms of the futures, it's funny that like, I wasn't going to tweet this because I'll get jumped on it, but your followers probably don't care. But it's funny, like when you used to go from Miami to like the United States, once again, you used to feel you're going a little bit developing world to first world a little bit because Miami was a little rough on the edges. And like now going from San Francisco to Miami, it's like the opposite. <laughs> yeah. so it's yeah, like yeah, going yeah. from third world to first. And I, it's like, oh, look, everything kind of works. There's law and order. It's not like a disaster. <laughs> I, like, I forgot who I saw it, but just recently I saw a tweet. It was going viral and it was uh, a thread. But the first tweet said something to the effect of like uh, Silicon Valley. Everyone was moving there. There was tons of growth. Uh, there was actually quite a bit of uh, housing being built in various ways. You saw cranes all the time, uh, like all these things. That everyone's like, oh, OK, things are going well. And now they went back three years later and they're like, holy shit, there's crime everywhere. This is an absolute uh, uh, declining city uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a safety standpoint, all these different things. And like people have left. And it reminds me, I think it was uh, Keith Raboy who talked about like Detroit. Detroit used to be booming. Now it's not. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, I don't quite, I mean, yeah, I don't quite buy Keith's line. I mean, he obviously has very strong views. Um, Why do you disagree? Well, because Detroit isn't, like embedded in the middle of a natural paradise called Northern California, mm-hmm. for one, right? For as much as trash you might talk about San Francisco, and it definitely has real problems, the surrounding area is basically paradise. I mean, you can go mm-hmm. skiing and surfing on the same day. You've got wine country. I mean, it's the city itself is still gorgeous in its own weird way. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be Detroit, right? And and to be honest, San Francisco has been in a, in a boom bust cycle since 1849, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. This is hardly new. This is just a, another downturn. Um, but but I do but I do agree that something has kind of flipped and Florida has become much more serious, right? It's like it's it's weird because in the outside world you have like the Florida man trope. Yes. And Florida man definitely does exist, by the way, in like northern Florida in the panhandle. <laughs> like Florida man is real. But guess what? In South Florida, Florida man has high speed rail. Florida man can afford a house to raise a family in. Florida man has pretty good public schools, right? Florida man has law and order. California man, not so much, or at least SF man doesn't, right? And so like the tropes about like Florida's this joke, it's like, no, Florida's actually pretty well run. Um and so, yeah, I mean, things have have um, have definitely changed. And again, I, you know, I don't wish California ill. Like, I have to stay there. I have family there. So I, I hope the city sort of recovers. But it's it's weird walking around like South Park Soma, which you probably did back in the day 10 years ago. Like, literally the entire consumer Internet that you cared about was within like a three by seven block area. And you'd walk through South Park and there are the founders of Airbnb and there's a Sequoia partner. And it's like there was this vibrant hum of like everything happening in one place. Mm-hmm. And that's no longer the case. <laughs> yeah. I, I literally remember when uh, I flew out to interview at Facebook and uh, they were like, yeah, and then you're going to stay in Mountain View and you're going to come to the campus. And, all and I remember walking on campus and being like, holy shit, this is a, literally a different world. Uh, I grew up in North Carolina. Like th- there's nothing like that, right? And um, when you then saw how many people, the other thing that was really interesting was everyone was in person. And uh, I was recently talking to somebody I worked with at Facebook and it was like, there was all these people who were there and you kind of sort of knew as a special moment or special group like no one knew what everyone was going to go do later but like you're like i have never worked with this many smart right. people who uh have this velocity and, and just right. seem to like get shit done like this right and now those people obviously have gone and, and done amazing things you worked at facebook you worked at a number of different tech companies does it feel like the like in-person high octane group of people all there together like is that changing now and now you've got remote you've got people in different geographic locations like like how do you think about it i mean if you look at the occupancy rates for commercial real estate in san francisco they're super low so like the numbers don't lie that a lot of people have moved out of the city that said i've started so i just raised around for a company and hopefully we'll talk about it um one of the investors is this uh thing called south park commons a bunch of facebook you probably know who it is Aditya and rushi and so they've got like a space literally on south park um i think either inside or next to the building where twitter was founded and um, you know, there's also a lot of like great talent in San Francisco that yes. hasn't left because a lot of them still have family or you know real estate. And there's a lot of like really smart Fang people who've like dealt with global scale infra, kind of sitting around waiting to see what's next, <laughs> right? And they're not going to move, and they're still there, and they prefer in person work. And uh, I don't know. I, I plan on staying in San Francisco for the company again. I sort of have to, mm-hmm. um, but 
I don't think it's a terrible idea either from a recruitment perspective. Yeah. You know? uh, what about the leadership? So obviously DeSantis, I know that uh, you saw him speak yesterday. Yeah, I yesterday it was. I saw him speak. Yeah. Uh, and then Newsom, I saw uh, he's been running ads in Florida. He gave a speech recently. What, the, and what said, is up with that? Why is he running ads in Florida? What the, is that? Well, I have my theories. I'm curious what you think or what the view is from I, Florida. I don't know, but let me tell you what he said in a recent okay, interview, okay. which uh, uh, in a very – politician way he was like uh i don't like bullies and abbott and desantis are bullies and therefore uh i need somebody needs to stand up to them and he was like well are you gonna run for president and he goes uh right now i'm focused on california and like in all the talking points whatever uh and they're like so like why are you running ads in florida and he's like i don't like bullies and so it's like uh okay either you're running for president or like you're wasting money maybe both right but like what is going on here what is your theory? that's just as if desantis is, is like running around wedging people like what, what does he mean <laughs> Like DeSantis is being a bully. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I tweeted yesterday that I think SF and Miami are kind of like peaks into the future for those respective political philosophies for better and worse. And I think, yeah, I think Newsom and DeSantis have come to be the face of those worlds, right? Now that Trump is kind of fading to the background and the whole Trump machine is kind of falling apart, you know, I think DeSantis and Newsom are like the sort of the face of, of those different movements. And it's, it's very different attitudes. Like DeSantis' speech yesterday, um, you know, he hits on all his points and he hits on, you know, he, he's released campaign ads that more or less hit his talking points. And it's a very different message than Newsom. Yeah. yeah. It, what, what's fascinating to me also is uh, obviously people self-select uh, into certain political ideologies. And, and if these two things are going to go in opposite directions, they'll go live in certain cities. Uh, but the people in the middle, like – there's a lot more conversation around inflation, around taxes, yeah. around like like what happens to my personal wallet or, right. or pocketbook. Uh, and I have a friend who, who's lived in California his entire life, and he's like, dude, when it went over 50% taxes, yeah. he's like, psychologically, I was like, this sucks. Right, like, like, like enough. He's at forty nine. I was chill. Fifty one. I'm, I'm out. Right, like, like whatever for whatever right. reason. And I do think that there's a lot of things on both sides of the political aisle that like people are just waking up to it. And it's less about like is the difference between forty nine and fifty one really that big? No. Psychologically, though, huge, huge difference. Yeah. And obviously, it's exasperated by things like uh, uh, locking people in their homes and how they treated mask, no mask, whatever. But like you are just watching the polar opposites play out here. And I do wonder, like, do we ever get a return to the center or is it just going to be more and more extreme over time? Yeah, the tax thing is kind of interesting. So I, I you know, I have a house in northern Nevada, which is where I officially live. And uh, the real estate brokers was like, yeah, we have so many California clients and they just show up saying 13%, 13%. And that's the top state income tax rate in California. It's just like 13%. Um, so the, the tax thing, yeah, they, I mean, I don't want they to want to go to 18. And they, oh, do that? Okay, yeah. They, that's what they put forward. I don't know if they're going to get it passed, but 18 would put it at like, people would be paying like 56, 57%. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> I think the weird thing is like, people don't necessarily mind high taxes as long as they get something for it. But then you look at California's infra and it's like a joke. I mean, Florida's a lot, I, I don't mean to be a DeSantis, but just reporting on what he said in his thing and kind of his stack is like, look, we have like better roads, like better public schools. You can go to college for $6,000 a year here and no state income tax, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And you look at that and you compare it to the California deal, it's like, well, what are, you, what are you getting for that? I mean, as a side thing, by the way, it's just kind of interesting. I tried living in Europe. I'm one of the few people who actually lived in Europe. I have a new passport, so I can go live there. And it's odd you think, I actually penciled out the taxes. The U.S. is actually not a low tax regime at all. Like the total taxes you pay in California are comparable to the taxes you'd pay in Spain and Germany. But again, there you have sort of a national fabric and infrastructure that you pay for. And like in, in the United States, you don't. So yeah, I think people are like, yeah, I think it's a symbolic thing of like, wait, you're selling 51 cents of every dollar goes to the state. And like, in addition to that, I'm paying for private schooling and this and that to actually avoid the deteriorating infrastructure of the state while I'm out. Yeah. And so. Well, this idea of like you are buying something. Right. right? Well, you, you, most people don't think of it that way, but when you start but to you are, you are about, buying something, right? Yeah. And I don't know. I, I think American federalism is good, and I think different states should run their biz, their affairs different ways. And I, yeah, why is Newsom running ads in Florida? It's like, what do you care, man? <laughs> like, if you don't have to deal with DeSantis in Florida, then don't deal with it. Go run your own state, and we'll see, right? And if you look at the numbers, the numbers don't lie. California has led the leaderboard in, like, domestic immigration, and Florida and Texas have been tied for first and second in domestic immigration. And so if California is a great place to, leave, to, to live, why is everybody leaving, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, how do you feel about some of these? Let's take Florida and Texas as an example. Uh, and didn't mean to talk so much about politics, but right. wh whatever. Uh, how much of like their uh, interjection into like social issues versus like more of the legislation and business issues, like is just a natural product of the time that we live in and social media and, and, and that gets headlines and, and drives yeah. conversation versus like, uh, I don't know, going after Disney or uh, having certain types of policies, like those actually keep people or attract people to come move to your state and, and drive more revenue. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think... 
It's funny. I, again, I sound like I'm some sort of DeSantis shell or something, but in his, I, it's, it's his, you shill, mentioned his speech. Shill. Definitely not. No, I'm, I'm not absolutely not shilling for any politician. Um, but he did, in terms of the thinking, it's interesting. One of the numbers that struck, stuck in my head, because he cited a bunch of lists of like Florida victories. Mm-hmm. And one is, and I don't even know where you pull these numbers, a total influx of adjusted gross income. Apparently, you can measure that somehow, which is, I, which I, you know, is rather than people, it's like dollar signs. Mm-hmm. And I forget the numbers he cited, and I have a recording of it. But basically, he cited that Florida has one of the highest influx of adjusted gross income, mm-hmm. I, I, as if he was a growth marketer and yes. like an app developer saying, "Oh, the ARPUs are really high," <laughs> and the total ARPU and AOV went oh, yeah. through the roof. Oh, no, right? No, it was like this Hannah's giving like a growth. It's like, wow, that's. I guess that's an interesting way to think about it. And I guess Florida does think about it that way because you know there is a lot of fast money. In Florida, in the sense of like, yes. we, you know, people come here because they like the financial climate and there's a liquid real estate market and condos and stuff. And a lot of Latin Americans have the same mm-hmm. thing, right? And so um, it's interesting to think about it. Well, way. you even see, like, you know, it's important for us to talk about the downsides of this as well. So just in the city of Miami, prices have skyrocketed for real estate rent, even just everyday items. Some of that is uh, being experienced on a global scale, even a national scale, uh, in terms of loose monetary policy, like all that type right. of stuff. But like, there's very much a thing of uh, how many people made more than I don't know two hundred thousand dollars a year that lived in Miami three years ago, and then now, right. like a lot more. I don't know what right. the numbers are, but a lot more. Uh, so naturally, the average price of a lot of these things goes up and and, and continues to trend upwards. Uh, and so the impact on the people who have been here before that happened is not good, right? right they right. start to feel like, hey, I can't afford this. Why is everything getting so expensive? My income is not going up at the same right. rate. And, and we've seen uh, uh, that on a national scale, but but I think it's exasperated in Miami. And so you start to look at this and you're like, okay, cool. Like, yes, that is a great stat to point at and, and cheer for uh, because as a state level, like you're improving, but then there's real impact. And like, how do you yeah. deal with that? I don't know if there's states or cities that know how to deal with some of that going on. I mean, build more housing. That's one way to do it. Although in, in South Florida, you're somewhat limited, right? Because Miami expands to the west of the Everglades, and then that's it. <laughs> there's only so much space west you can go. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's funny. One of the weird things about like this whole tech thing when Delian did his whole Miami Tech Week, I guess there was in a pre-existing Miami Tech Week that got pissed off that like the founders, some people came in. And I don't even want to interject myself into that drama. But I, I found it interesting that people were assuming the tack of like, oh, these are like gentrifiers who are coming in. It's like, and it's odd that people were claiming like, oh, I'm the real Miami, when like that is the most un-Miami attitude ever, <laughs> right? Because like people have been coming here and gentrifying or carpetbagging since forever. I mean, that's what my parents did, right? Everybody, everyone, there's always a new generation that everyone finds obnoxious that shows up and kind of, you know, um, projects their reality on it. I remember when I was a little kid, it was funny. You know, again, Miami used to be very different than now, but I used to remember there used to be uh, bumper stickers on cars that said, can the last American who leaves Miami please bring down the flag, right? Because Miami was getting totally dominated by human Hispanics. <laughs> and again, I, you know, they're completely just unselfconsciously what they are. They're yes. a little obnoxious, frankly, and they just impose like their culture, not impose, but they just, they don't give a shit. They're not going to try to meet. They're super American, but they're not going to like, you know. Which is American. Which like, is American. Like, that really is American. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Right. It's like in Godfather 2 when the Italians are having like their San Gennaro festival and like no one's sitting there trying to integrate with anything. They're just like, oh, no, of course we're going to carry this festival from Naples or whatever and have it in New York. Of course we are. It's the same thing in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that this, and, and when I saw your tweet, like I almost tweeted and then didn't, and we could talk about why, but uh, I was like, man, Miami seems to be one of the places where like people are still understanding the importance of America, the uh, uh, value of like true freedom, not right. not the bullshit shit like hey i can go outside whatever but like actually hey i just came from a really bad place this place is way better and i am proud of the fact that i either got here that i live here that these right. ideals are, are what i am choosing to go in and, and live within uh and it does feel like maybe florida and texas specifically but also some other places around the united states like they're trying to amp that back up because they feel like uh that's being lost on, on a national scale yeah, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I remember one of the sort of boomer phrases my father used to use a lot. Somebody mentioned this on Twitter as well. That's like, people used to say, oh, it's a free country, right? <laughs> and the, the idea is typically like, you usually say something's like, well, that sounds kind of dumb, but whatever, like, what do I care? No skin yes. off my back. And sometimes we don't say that anymore. We don't say, you know, somebody does something dumb, but, you know, it's a free country. It's like, oh, no, that person's a bully. They need Their behavior yes. needs to be corrected. It's like, why? <laughs> like, Spe- speaking of uh, the people that get accused of being a bully, whether they are or not, you mentioned earlier the Trump machine is falling apart. Yeah. You think he's done? He, no way he can be president again? I, you know, I hate to make political predictions because my ability to make them is bad. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I just um, – I don't know. I'm here to report on a political conference, so I'm kind of thinking about what the, the future of the American right wing. Um, I, I think we're – what I see in the Trump movement, to the extent I can diagnose anything, is a sort of Jacksonian populism, which has been a strain in American politics. For, what is for, that? 
So, That's you know, a smart and, thing. I don't know. Yeah. So, so, you know, Andrew Jackson, obviously, uh, Old Hickory, um, obviously a colored, a colored record when it came to many things. Yes. But um, there was an essay by Walter Russell Mead that came out right when Trump got elected. It was very good. I wish I could quote it from memory. But basically, the, the idea behind Jacksonian populism is less... It's definitely not like Yankee New England, that's for sure. It's obviously more a Southern orientation. And it, 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 it interprets the United States of America as being less a creedal nation, less defined by a document, and more, you know, a nation in almost the European sort of blood and soil sort of way. Um, and it, it's a very populist set sentiment, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of what, what was behind the Tea Party movement mm-hmm. and the Trump movement. And it's, it's just this... There's very strains in American political thought, and occasionally they kind of erupt, right? Mm-hmm. And um, arguably Trump was an eruption of that Jacksonian populism, and I think that strain exists. I mean, Trump could get hit by a bus or keel over from a heart attack tomorrow, and that strain will still be there, right? Mm-hmm. And the question is what expresses it. Anyhow, and so um, I think other politicians can can you know, look at people like J.D. Vance, Blake Masters, DeSantis. They're all this kind of new generation of politicians who are – all very well educated. They all have a lot of Ivy League degrees and what you would think of as being sort of the elite background. Mm-hmm. And yet what I find interesting about them is that they've turned their back in t- to some degree on that elite background, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, Blake Masters is casting himself as the populist and he, you know, he actually is from Arizona, but he's also, you know, Peter Till's wealth manager. <laughs> it's hardly, he doesn't exactly work at a Cabela's, right? Um, so yeah, it, it, I don't know. It's an interesting crop Cabela's. of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of Cabela's because I, 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 sh- I used to shop there more than I do now, but I always, I always see it as like, it's like, the, you know, the United States is divided into either REI people and Cabela's people here, yeah. or, or Bass Pro Shop people. You're either one or the other, right? And it's funny because you go into those stores and, the, and they're supposed to be outdoorsy stores, yes. but the products they sell are completely different, yeah. right? And REI is like mountain climbing, super expensive mountain climbing gear, all these fancy bikes and shit. Uh, and that's it. And then you go to Cabela's and it's like basically guns and boats and camo and camping equipment that's a lot less fancy, right? And it's just a different conception of nature, basically, is, is what it boils down that, to. That's a great <laughs> framework. I've never heard that before, but that is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. You either show, you have a, I'm actually, I have both REI and Cabela's loyalty card cards. I'm one of the few, but I think most Americans have one or the other in their wallet. When, yeah. when you think about uh, this rise of like populism and, and all this happening, uh, is it, Again, just a product of like the times we live in, and so people are being opportunistic and seeing seeing it. Or do you think that uh, these folks with Ivy League degrees and all this stuff, and, and kind of like they're turning their back on on uh, maybe what got them to where they are or whatever, uh, is it more so like, hey, I grew up a certain way, I see that that's no longer here, and like I have to go be the one to to kind of bring it back, or a resurgence of some like past uh, component of American politics. I, I think that's right. I think if you look at the the, the family bios of people like DeSantis and certainly Vance, whose background has been a whole book, I'm not so sure about Masters, is, but th- there is a connection to not that elite class. And so I think something rattling around in their heads is, is part of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think the a lot of what's going on in this right is kind of interesting in that, you know, the left is sort of, it, it's a bizarre inversion of European politics, right? In European politics, the left is typically kind of Marxist and classist in orientation, and the right tends to be nationalist or even racist in orientation in a different extreme form. And the United States is kind of the reverse, right? The left is kind of weirdly ethnically and racially obsessed. And the right, I would say here, is kind of a class conscious movement, right? This feeling of the middle class feeling they're getting screwed by the upper class, right? And the weird shaking out of like the left coalition is basically, you know, I, I would typify it as like, People who live off of DoorDash and the people who deliver it to them, right? That's the left coalition. People who shop at Whole Foods and then people who get it welfare. While those on the right tends to be the – in fact, Peter Thiel, one of the quotes from his speech was, you know, the Republicans are the party for the middle class and the de- Democrats are the party for everybody else, right? And so that's a, that's a strange split in, in American mm-hmm. politics. And I think other thinkers of – you could cite people like um, Burnham, Samuel Francis, you know, thinkers who sort of – framed at some point there would be a middle American revolt, right? That the, the American middle class would revolt against the, it's sort of elite overseers. Um, another book that I love is uh, uh, Lashes, The Revolt of the Elites. He describes how, again, there was this elite class that would turn its back. Like back in the day, right? A, you had more regional elites. Every little state had its own little elites. And then the sort of consumption and lifestyle patterns of a wealthy person and a middle class person weren't that different in America. Mm-hmm. Like everyone kind of shopped at Macy's and it was this very middle class mass market society. And at some point, that split. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now you have an elite that lives very, very differently. And someone in San Fr- an elite in San Francisco lives very, very differently than my neighbors in the desert highlands outside of Reno, right? They, mm-hmm. They're kind of, they're completely different. They live in totally different worlds. And that wasn't so much the case. Um, 
So I think that's causing, that is at its core what's causing this friction. And I think a lot of this new right is a rebellion against that elite. You know? I, I think uh, a lot about uh, what you're calling elite rich versus right. like redneck rich. Yes. Right. I, growing up in North Carolina, like yeah, there yeah. was people who they had money, but they didn't have I believe, degrees or, right, right. or Ferraris. They had a tricked out truck with a lift and right. like the whole thing. Which by the way can be expensive as shit, by the way. Like right. you see, like in Reno, you see some of these like, hundred percent. that's an $80,000 like Jeep <laughs> Rubicon, like 60K base at least. And you've put at least 34K into it. You are not poor. Right. <laughs> Red, redneck rich. Right. right. right? Like, like the right. whole idea of redneck rich was basically like, uh, it doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, don't have means. It right. just means that you express the wealth in a different way. And uh, I specifically remember uh, there was kids that uh, went to like local high schools and stuff like that. And uh, there was one area they would take these trucks and they would go like mudding. Right. Right. And yeah. like, you're like, okay, cool. Got it. Like you have to have a truck that can actually like yeah. go into the mud and yeah. come out. Yeah. Right. right? Cause yeah. if you just take a, a stock truck in there, like it's not coming out. And yeah. so uh, to some degree, the country feels like the redneck rich now have a voice with the internet. Whereas maybe they didn't have that before. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, when I say elite people often kind of call bullshit and what, what are you calling elite? Aren't you an elite? This and that's like, there's something different about it. Right. Like, you know, some guy with like, you know, a, a Dartmouth degree and $150,000 in student loans who writes for an East Coast literary thing and lives in Brooklyn that are part of an elite class. The guy who has four car dealerships in Asheville, <laughs> right, and makes 600 k a year, he is not elite, even though their incomes are very, very different, right? Um yeah, it's that's that's the delta. It's what do you what, like when you look at those two people? Like, what do you think makes up the difference? And is it, it obviously money is not one of the things? Uh, it could be a thing, but but this isn't the thing. Um, is it education? Is it like view of the world? Like, what, what, yeah, I, view of the world, politics. Um, you know, the whole wokeness thing, which I don't typically like getting in the middle of. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's there's a difference in attitude. There somehow you stare at the world from the elite pedestal. And I, you know, you and I have lived inside this world, right? And there's a set of sort of moral assumptions about the world, and you step outside of it, and there's a whole different set of moral assumptions, mm -hmm. right? Like the fact you've got the flag behind you, right? Like you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't do a Zoom at a at a fan company nowadays with like a flag behind you, right? Um, and uh, you, yeah. want hear, you want to hear a crazy story? I've let's never, hear. It. I've never said this before. Okay, let's hear. Uh, it. <laughs> uh, let me say this in the most unidentifiable way possible. Uh, there is somebody that we work with uh, who, uh, not a person, a, an organization. Okay. Uh, and uh, I made a video and the fly was in the back and they're like, hey, can you not do that again? And I thought, I was ready to golf. Like I had the tweet locked and loaded. I was going to fucking <laughs> go to town. Like this was going to be the Super Bowl. It was like draw the line in the sand. Like, fuck you. Um, and then it came out like the company, I don't know, 5% of the sales or something is in America. And this video was going to be put on a website and they didn't want to think it was only for America. So like, okay. we, we, like we have no problem. Like if you want part of it to have it or whatever, but just like, can you do it in a way right. so that like they know that it's not just an American thing, like it's available globally. And I was like, okay, fine. Like, let me, you know, put the tweet in my drafts and keep it warm in case I need it later. <laughs> um, kind of like put the gun back in the holster, but it's still loaded. Um, but, but, uh, but, but it, it was this like weird thing. Like my first reaction when I saw it was like, no. Right. And to right. your point, like, I don't think if you work at uh, some of these companies, right. you can do that or somebody would say something again, right. you can buck the trend, whatever, uh, stand up for what you think is right. But, uh, you might not work there very long, uh, for the reasons, whatever. It does feel like this weird thing yeah. where that is now, uh, a contentious point. Yeah, yeah. I think for, for the longest time, um, the company, Andrew, I'm probably mispronouncing it, um, on their careers page, used to have this massive American flag in it. And I theorized that it was like basically not filter. Right, it's basically a filter. And I think I actually tweeted it at Palmer Lucky and he, and he replied, yeah, 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 that was intentional. <laughs> or somebody from Andrew said, yeah, 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 that wasn't an accident. Because they, they have this enormous flag, like I'm sure you've seen Patton, right? Yes, when George yeah, C. Yeah, Scott comes yeah, yeah, out yeah. with like a flag the size of a wall. Yes. They had like that hanging in their general area and then they had a photo of that on their careers page. Yeah. And I think that was intentional. That was the garlic to the vampire. Yeah. So I, I, I'm fascinated by this whole like how do you communicate uh, implicitly, um, especially when you start uh, finding the intersection of technology, politics, like uh, national, like all these different things that, that come together. And uh, sometimes the best way to understand like what's happening in America is to look elsewhere. And so uh, I saw a tweet, I think two days ago or yesterday, uh, Zelensky from uh, Ukraine, he gave this whole speech and uh, it's tr translated and, you know, who, who knows how accurate it is. But the general idea was like, uh, you know, fuck you, Russia. Uh, if you give us the choice between uh, gas or you, we will take gas. Uh, uh, no gas or you, we will take no gas. If you give us the choice between you and no water, we will take no water. Like all these things. And like, by the way, history proves that like at the end we will have gas, water, electricity, like all stuff, and we will be without you. Right. And and you listen to the speech and the person was like, oh, he's going full like Winston Churchill. 
And you're sitting there like, oh, okay, we have an actor comedian who is now communicating in a way that is obviously very compelling to a lot of people. He is essentially going in front of the American uh, markets and saying, like, you should invest in Ukraine in the middle of a war. Like, all these things. And he's doing it with, like, a flag behind him. He's doing it uh, dressed very specifically. Like, you're meeting American politicians who, they had time to put on their suits and ties, but you look like you literally just got off the battlefield. Right. And, like, (laughs) you're, you're standing inside of the government buildings in Kiev or whatever. How do you like break that down? You literally went to Ukraine, so you have more. Insight I spent a little bit of time people. there. Yeah, yeah, I spent a little bit of time in the western part of the country because um, at the early part of the war, it was kind of exciting, and it felt like the image we we're having in the United States was, um, you know, was obviously misinterpreted. And so, uh, okay, uh, a colleague of mine at the Lincoln Network, this DC think tank that I'm a part of, uh, he's reported from conflict zones in the past. He's like, hey, why not? Why don't we go? I'll, I'll set up the fixtures and stuff. You just come along and split the cost. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll ride with you. He ended up he ended up eventually interviewing Zelensky for Wired magazine and going all the way to Kiev. Um, I had to go do a podcast of all things. So I had to, <laughs> I had to go do Rogan. It was kind of funny. I was, I was literally in, in Joe Rogan pulled you out of a I know, war zone. Yeah, no, I was, in, I was in, I was in Lviv in, in Western Ukraine with like a starling hanging out of my window, like, like texting the booker guy. And I'm like, dude, like, I hate to break it to you, but I'm, I'm like actually in a war zone. Like I, it's going to be hard for me to get back in time. Can we just like zoom it in? And it might be kind of cool. Cause I'm like zooming from Ukraine. He's like, no, you have to physically be here. Like we can reschedule, but it'll be months ahead. So like you decide, I'm like, Fuck. And so I like pack up the wow. starlight like, and spend the three or four days it took to like get back. And again, I wasn't that de- I wasn't that deep into it at all. But it's weird, like um, I mean, you served, right? So yes. you yeah, yeah. And so you know how your risk threshold kind of changes? It's like yeah. it's kind of scary when when I was like humping my bag with like body armor and the Starlink and shit across the cause you can't take cars across the border. Yeah. So you're literally walking across the border into like this unknown future. I'm like, man, I'm like, this Antonio is kinda, walked into war zone you know, with you know, Starlink on his back. Well, right, no, well, it was fucking <laughs> scary. And then it was weird too, because like the border checkpoint, there's like this line that stretched for miles of refugees to get out. Yes. And you're like walking alone and they're like staring at you, like, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> like, what are you doing walking in that direction, bro? I'm like, and like walking across like this this feels really dumb <laughs> like i don't know what i'm doing was this it feels- just you two or was uh, yeah it was no it was just us two yeah uh, it was me and no the- like when you're crossing the border there's literally nobody going in oh no no yeah. um you would see legionnaires at the time they were recruiting the foreign legion and then yep. you would see other media yep. and so you'd see other press with their bulletproof vest with the press tag on it yep. and you'd see young healthy men who had kit from various camo patterns yep. who were clearly from different militaries who were showing up and yeah, yeah. and there was nobody else <laughs> the the um the the few people that i've seen go uh their former us military right. defense contractors whatever uh when they're there i'm like looking around i'm like man that looks kind of crazy like you got a bunch of people with guns <laughs> and the kids and they're like running around and everything and then uh you see the media which obviously uh, when i was in iraq they, they were there uh very different time like it was kind of like hey get in the vehicle shut up and like you know if you put us in danger to like, we're going to fucking freak out. Um, but here, like there's like walking down the street and I, yeah. I don't know, it just seems kind of different. Well, it was, I, I mean, it's a country, it's a country, it's something I'd never experienced before. I expect none of us have ever experienced. It's a country in total war, right? It's a country, mm-hmm. it's a European nation that has gotten invaded and social order is kind of not totally broken down in an anarchic way, but, but most of society is either trying to get out women. And ch- so men couldn't get out. So it was mm-hmm. like, if you're, if you're at the Polish border, it's just literally like women and children, like a woman with like two kids and a little cat in the bag and a little rolly bag. Mm-hmm. Like it's basically all they have in the clothes on their back, just like walking across the border to an unknown, like that's it. And you just see like this endless stream of such people. Mm-hmm. And what's going on on the other side of the border? Cause I think a lot of people don't realize this. Like once they get over there, are they meeting like family and friends? Are there just like random some people are, trying to help some them? Some are having like tearful reunions, mm-hmm. but usually it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's a little dated now. I'm sure it's quiet now compared to what it used to be, but there was enormous number of like Jose Andres, the Spanish chef, his world central kitchens, I think it's called was all over the place. I interviewed just a random Polish woman from the village. She's like, oh yeah, the refugees are coming. So like she had this big thing of soup that she was doing her best them. to help. Yeah, yeah. So Europe really just mustered in a huge way. I mean, every train station in Poland became a refugee camp basically because they're all camp. Like the Warsaw train station was totally taken over by refugees. You know, it was it was li- literally millions of refugees, like a quarter of the Ukrainian population fled. Um, so it was uh, it was a chaotic situation. Then you got on the inside, and there's again more refugees coming out, but then also men and material going east, right? Mm-hmm. And then all of society, like there's a scene there. It was in Del- on a Sunday, a bunch of high school kids, like having fun, joshing. Like you think, oh, they're having a big, it's like, no, they're filling sandbags and pulling the sandbags around statues because they thought airstrikes were happening. And there were a few airstrikes in the live later. And so they're, you know, and they're shuttering everything. It's just like those scenes you see in black and white from World War II mm-hmm. was kind of the vibe, right? Yeah. Um, even though this is far away from the front lines, to be clear. Um, yeah, that, that was the feeling. And, it, and that's when I kind of realized like, man, I don't know, like, I think the Russians can have a hard time winning because everyone was so mobilized. They would literally punctuate said, you know, sentences with we will win and like these steely eyed gazes and everyone kind of mobilized. Like, 
I don't know, man. This <laughs> Ukraine's so, a big place. It's so when I saw this happening, yeah. one of the first things I thought about was, uh, God forbid that this happened in the United States. Somehow yeah. somebody figured it out and they invaded the United States. Yeah. Would we have the same response? And I don't think we would. I think, well, I think, uh, I might show my political stripes. I, I think, I think you would have that. I think you would have the response. You think so? I think it wouldn't be the people you'd expect. Um, okay. Interesting. Yeah, this is this is where the redneck side of me comes out. I think uh, <laughs> I think the people you see at shooting ranges in California, uh, who tend to those guys are going to the Sierra and red dawn the whole fucking thing. I think the people you know a lot of people the urban dwellers absolutely would not, and they would just go along with whatever the regime is. Um, yeah, I think um, you know you've probably gone shooting in California back in the day, and it's you know mostly rural whites, a lot of Asians, a lot of Hispanics. Like those guys would hole up and like smuggle arms around and like muster for a militia. And a lot of people would just get on the first plane and get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it's, um, it's fascinating because if you really think about, uh, Ukraine, like, again, it, this is a story as old as time, but like you're there, you've got your family, you've got a business you're running, whatever. And next thing you know, like literally your family's refugees. Right. And it, and it happens in a matter right. of days. Uh, what was the most surprising thing that you felt like you saw on the ground that maybe wasn't being told in America or was like being misrepresented, uh, in America? I, I guess I think the level of, the level of mobilization and sort of national solidarity that there was, right? I knew, I knew nothing about Ukraine. I still don't know very much about Ukraine. Don't speak any Eastern European or Slavic languages. So to me, it was a vastly foreign country. And I guess, you know, once I was there, I did start reading about it. Ukrainian nationalism has been a thing. It's had very much a checkered past, um, as, as many movements did during World War II. Um, but there's been this U Ukrainian national movement for a couple centuries now. And it's odd that, you know— Nationalism, we think of countries as having existed forever because like France has existed forever, but its, it's politics has been very different. Or Spain has existed forever, but its politics has been very different. And the emergence of what we now call the nation state with sort of a, a secular, mostly secular administrative state uh, with a notion of national unity and you're a citizen of a certain country rather than an empire or a dynasty, that's kind of a novelty, right? And that, that struck all of Europe. The United States is one of the great experiments in, 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 in nation state creation. Um, but a lot of countries didn't get their own nation for a while, right? The Poles, the Czechs, the the Serbians, the Slovaks, et cetera. And somehow the Ukrainians never got theirs either. <laughs> and somehow we're seeing the fruition of this nationalist movement. I think if you talk to Ukrainians, a lot of things changed um, with the protests against the previous, what was considered a Russian stooge. Um, and it's, it's odd to see, well, I'll go fucking angry and crazy and yelling and screaming in your podcast if you go that direction. But there's a lot, of, a lot of American commenters, particularly on the right, who were remarkably sympathetic to Putin and thought the Ukrainians should just roll over and who have frankly shut the fuck up about the war since then, since they got it so completely wrong, clearly. But, um, you know, who wanted to just deny the fact or claim that the 2014 was like a CIA op. It's like, dude, look at the photos. There's like a million Ukrainians in that protest. Like the CIA crisis actor budget must have been pretty goddamn lit <laughs> if you claim this is a CIA op. It's like, no, like I hate to break. And I, Americans often have this attitude. It's like they think everything is a projection of their own domestic political neuroses, right? Yes. Like if the CIA lifts a little finger, oh, then like a million person riot happens and keeps like, dude, if only. Like, no, <laughs> that's not how it actually works. They have their own political processes. They have their own political crises and they have their own thoughts and views about the world that don't don't line up with American domestic political priorities. That's just the reality of it. And if you want to understand that world, you have to get out of your American attitude, understand and see the world from their perspective, right? And if you talk to them, it's like, dude, we've had democracy for whatever it is, seven or eight years. We're not giving it up now. We're not going to be under Putin's heel. That's it. I will, I will die for this country, right? Yeah. And that, yeah, and that's that's something that I think caught everyone by surprise. Um, funny, a friend of mine, I won't name names or whatever, he was a Mormon missionary to Ukraine. He was there before the previous Russian invasion and the, the war in the East. And he was surprised at how much Ukrainian nationalism and resilience there was. So a lot of it clearly was a very recent phenomenon. But I think, you know, Zelensky not leaving. Everyone, you know, he's, he's supremely popular there. I think Zelensky, this whole business of like, I don't need a ride, I need ammo, right? I think that rallied a nation in a big way. And um, it know, was some baller shit. Like, that was, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's some baller shit. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the other piece that uh, I saw a lot of people talking about is like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, he's acting like, you know, people are dropping bombs on his city and like, he's like literally like uh, running from uh, bunker to bunker. Like he's, you know, got politicians coming to visit him. He's in this or whatever. I was like, I don't think that uh, this was like, uh, hey, I'm going to die if I stay or not. It was the symbol of like, we're not, we're not running. We're going to fight. And, and to some degree, like the morale of the country seemed to shift. And I think right. that uh, part of it also was like, he seems to very well understand American culture and oh, yeah. like how to kind of pull the strings. Because when he said that specific line, it felt like America was like, fuck yeah, that guy sounds awesome. Right. right? <laughs> oh, his marketing is incredible, which is a good thing, right? Every, every war has propaganda, right? That's part of the war. I mean, America did in World War II. And so that's definitely part of it. But I, I would clarify that, I mean, he was in bunkers hiding from bombs in the early part of the war. Kiev was encircled, right? The thought that he would survive 
you know, Wagner mercenaries were dispatched to try to murder him. Like, I mean, nowadays, yes, you're right. I mean, Vitalik can just go to the Kiev blockchain thing and it's not that hard to get to. But that was not the case in early March when things were much more sort of loosey-goosey. So, and, and when that happened, like, what do you think was the big shift? Was it literally that they've pushed the forces back? I know now we yeah, have yeah. The, kind of an advance that's happening that, that everyone uh, believes has a lot of momentum to it. But uh, I, I don't think people quite understand um, – uh, it, it feels like the story in America has been Russia has tried to invade. They've had some successes, but they're running into resistance. And like, that's the story. Not so much that like, no, maybe actually they're like losing ground. Now there's this advance. Now there's like almost right. a, 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 a counter punch that's occurring. And like, if we know anything about military history, like that's usually, if you can keep that momentum, like that's how you end up victorious is not so much like, uh, Hey, we resist in the beginning. It's no, we resist. And then we counter punch. And that seems to be happening now. This episode is brought to you by eight sleep. Good sleep is a game changer. And the eight sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, yeah, the big news there is obviously that the the question was, can the Ukrainians go on the offensive and recapture territory? It's one thing to actually defend territory. It's another thing to actually take territory. Um, and yeah, I think the rolling back the Russians from Buka. It's funny, did you ever work with uh, Dwight? Crow? No, you didn't. He probably left. Dwight Crow, Facebook PM. I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I ran into him like a week ago at South Park Commons in, in South Park. Okay. Last time I talked to him was through a Starlink connection. Dude, that guy was actually in the shit. He was serving... Um, I never published an interview with him. I probably should. He was serving in a volunteer ambulance crew on the front lines, actually, in Kiev. Shut up. No, he absolutely. He would do that. He, he, I, he would do that, and he did that. Like, he, I, I, he, I saw the video. Dude, he was, like, losing. He was in a, in a hospital in the front lines. He'd go out, volunteer basis, and go pull the civilian dead bodies from, from the, or the injured from the front lines. I, I wish we were having this conversation not on air, but uh, he, he always struck me as the type of guy who, like, he's going to live life, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the one thing I remember about Dwight is uh, – uh, I think he posted on Facebook. He like went and he climbed maybe Mount Kilimanjaro or something. And he like, did Everest like a month ago. Or, okay, yeah. yeah. So like he, he'd been climbing these things or whatever. I think it was Kilimanjaro when he did it. And he was like, I got to the top and I couldn't fucking breathe. And I like crawled my way to the sign because <laughs> I was going to get this fucking photo. <laughs> right? and, and he had like you know, like a selfie or whatever. And I remember just being like, yep, that checks out. Like yeah. that is the type of person he is. So to hear this is not shocking. Oh, yeah. You know, I should go back to him. We should probably publish that interview. Um, but yeah, no, he was, he was in the front lines. And then um, he survived though. He came back. And, um, but yeah, no, getting back to the Ukraine thing. Yeah. I mean, the business of being on the offensive, will they reclaim territory? Will they take Odessa? You know, there's a lot of questions, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's clear that attitudes in the Ukraine have hardened, like they're willing to compromise and more or less give up much of the Crimea to, to the Russians. Um, but that's no longer true. And part of their national conception is actually claiming it all back. Um, yeah. we'll see. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I have no, obviously no insight to what they're actually thinking, but I have to imagine that they understand that European resolve might waver given their energy costs. Europe's going to freeze this winter. It does not look well. <laughs> um, I think I retweeted a pretty harsh joke that said, um, you know, what did the British use to, um, to uh, light their homes before candles? Electricity. <laughs> Electricity, right. It's like, oh, oof. Um, I take no joy in that joke, by the way, but it is, it's one of these jokes that like reveals the greater truth yes. there, which yes. is like, ooh. So, and he must understand that resolve for the war has to waver in European politics, given the, the privations. The, the story that, uh, from Russia, and again, I, I want to be careful, I don't get all of this, uh, data points wrong, because everyone in the comments will definitely let us know. Uh, but, um, it does feel like, uh, there's this thing like there's like been like eight Russian uh energy executives, oil executives, whatever, who have mysteriously gone missing, died, whatever. Uh and then we get pipelines shut down and yeah. like, hey, we're not turning it back on. Like there, there's all this stuff going on. And I think that Americans are like, oh, that shit that like we thought actually happens, like that does happen. Like like you know what I mean you can kind of almost see like, oh, I thought that was just like in history or I thought that was like in uh fiction books. Like that's like real stuff. And I've talked to a couple of friends and they're like, 
oh, and I'm like, yeah, it's a fucking war. Like they're literally trying to kill each other. Right. And and to some degree, I think America got so uh, blunted to like the realities of war because we were at war for 20 years and it was just kind of like this thing that happens and every once in a while there's like a news story or right. whatever. But like if you're, you know, 18, 19 years old, like you did not live a single day without America at war in the Middle East. Right. Now America, well, it technically is not fighting in the war. Uh, well, they are. It's a proxy war. <laughs> <laughs> How many you, billions you have you given to Ukraine? You said <laughs> it, not me. Well, the, the, the the thing that I saw, which uh, just blew my mind, is like, hey, we have billions of dollars for uh, Ukraine to fight a war, but we don't have enough money to solve the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, right? And so like a little bit of like, hey, why are we so worried about all these other problems around the world, uh, uh, which uh, is up for debate. But it does feel like America, to some degree, like the initial invasion was a big moment. And then like we just go back to like kind of being blunted to the realities of it. Yeah, well, we're right, because you're right, because that – the United States has been continuously at war. In fact, it's involved in, what, six or seven different conflict regions at least right now. And nobody thinks about it because you basically outs outsource it to a small minority of people since we have a professional army and there's no conscription. And I think it creates this level of media cynicism about war that it literally is like the current thing. Like one of the things that most pissed me off about the Ukraine is like, oh, I don't see Ukraine in my feed. I guess it's the current thing. <laughs> yeah, because a fucking shooting war is just a media cycle to you. Is that is that what you think it is? It's like, no, it's a little bit more than that. And, and by the way, no, the war is not over. We're still giving them billions. There's still people die. And there's still this whole thing going on. Just just because you don't see it in your feet, it's not. It doesn't mean it's not real. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, but of course, the media side of it does matter, and Zelensky understands that, which is why he's he's leading the propaganda war that he is. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that a big part of this was like Ukrainians, like I'll die for my country. Right. Uh, you also wrote a piece. Uh, Would you die for the Dow? Oh right, yeah, I think or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, Dow slightly li snarky headlines, li literally snarky being headlines. decentralized autonomous organization. Yeah, yeah. And it was somewhat of a uh, a review summary critique, whatever you want to call it, of uh, Balaji Srinivasan's the network yeah. state. So talk a little bit about uh, you know. The United States, Ukraine, Russia, yeah. like now there's this new idea of like, let's go create like cities in the cloud, right? right. Which I think uh, Balashi's done a great job of yeah. articulating and, and kind of laying out. Uh, what did you kind of take away from that? Yeah, yeah, that was a review of, of Balashi's network state and also Vitalik's response. But Vitalik wrote a very long piece about it as well. And I think it's a fascinating concept and I recommend reading the book actually. I also interviewed him on my um, on my podcast, The Pull Request. You can get it on Apple Podcasts. I, I had a long conversation with Balashi about it. Um, and to be clear, like, you know, I, Balashi and I don't really disagree. At, at some fundamental level, he understands. So let me just frame what the problem is and then what the, the debate became. So Balaji's idea, I mean, there's a lot of Balaji in there. And if you know Balaji, I'm sure you've had a lot of interesting conversations that, as I've had um, with Balaji. He's an interesting character. So like the first half is like pure, like Balaji's brain and view of the world, <laughs> <laughs> which is fascinating. There's literally like seven links in one sentence, like very Which is things. why we all love him. Okay, right. Yes. No, no, he's amazing. He's amazing. The guy, I don't know how he manages all the tabs, but he's got to have some. He, <laughs> Balaji Srinivasan has some sort of tab right. management system that none of us have yet figured out. I mean, you're right. His brain has 200 open tabs at all times. That's <laughs> the reality. And his CPU still runs somehow. My MacBook Pro can handle it, but Balaji's brain can. Um, yeah, and then at the end, I wish he had spent more. I mean, he's he's had, you can find it online, by the way. He, it's a beautiful website online, and he's added chapters to it. But in the original book, he, he gets into what he called the network state. And the idea here is that um, imagine a sort of federated, I mean, in the same way that like, I, I made this comment in my critiques, like imagine Balajistan, let's just give it a name, existed, right? <laughs> and we're Balajistanis, right? And we literally just move from three or four neighborhoods in San Francisco to the same three or four neighborhoods in Miami, the same in New York. And let's say there's actual borders, passports, the whole deal. Would we even notice? It's like, no, because we'd never cross a border. We would literally just fly from one to the other. And so I think Balaji is absolutely right that like de facto, this is it's already the case that there's a self- sort of selecting set of people who live in this weird disembodied, somewhat elite realm, to be honest, that fly between these various cities and live a different life. And they have much more in common than they do with even people like- Down some, the street. That, right, down the street, right. Um, and some could say that's a bad thing, and maybe it is. Um, I personally, one of the things, one of the weirdest things I think that's happened in 200 years, and you and I are probably roughly the same age, so you probably remember the analog era a little bit, right? It's like you remember getting letters, right? Like information used to move as fast as like physical objects would move, and now they don't. Information is uncoupled from, from physical movement, which means who you are, what you think, what you believe is uncoupled from your surroundings. Mm -hmm. And that means the little colored squares on the map called Miami, Florida, State of Florida, United States of America are uncoupled from what who you think, believe, talk with, et cetera. And I think that's a major change. And somehow a lot of the... Getting back to the whole DeSantis versus Newsom war and everyone moving to different states, like that's, I think Balaji called it defragmenting a disc. Like remember back in the in the, in the DOS days and or even current Windows, and like the memory is written all over, and then at some point you've got to take all the apps' memory and take it to one place because it gets too inefficient. He's like, yeah, the network state is basically defragmenting people and putting all the people that actually have common values and are willing to live under the same rules 
in the same physical place because the physical so to be clear this is not transhumanism this is not vr this is not uploading your brain it's like no 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 no. we need like physical boots on the ground so to speak place to live seat at the un laws people who take out the garbage but for a self you know sort of selecting set of people um that's his thesis and yeah. you know again like i said like i'm i'm partial to it because i think the political crisis that he highlights is very real um the question is would you die for the Dow, right? Because not that everything is fucking war and fighting. These days, obviously, very little of life is. But at some level, you have to say, even if it's not like I will die for the Dow, it's like I will raise my children inside this environment, right? Mm -hmm. That's the real bet you make. And are people actually willing to do that? Because, uh, you know, you probably know the same people. Dryden at Praxis. There's a lot of, and, you know, the Prosper people, like all very interesting. I'm like super pro makers and builders and doing cool new stuff. I don't want to ding them at all. But I do wonder, it's like, well, you need some oomph there. And it's funny, I, I like Joe tweeted a few months ago, a lot of this charter nation business is like Zionism without Judaism, right? And then like literally just yesterday, Bala, she said, oh, no, no, I wasn't inspired by Neil Stevenson. I was inspired by Theodore Herzl, <laughs> the founder of modern Zionism, right? And it's true, right? And the, the Zion, for those who aren't familiar with Zionism or with Judaism for that matter, right? A lot of Zionism, getting back to the, the national, all these nationalist movements sprung up in late 19th century Europe, mm -hmm. right? Including a lot of the Ukrainian uh, nationalist movement. And in the case of the Jewish one, it's a little strange because it's not like, oh, the ground we sit on should become a country rather than the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's like, well, we're not even on the ground, but we are a people because we've been living in exile for almost 2,000 years, and therefore we should move somewhere else. And before the current location of Israel was the thing, there was plans of Argentina, Uganda, all sorts of places where the Jews would move to. Um, but there was always this feeling of like, yeah, the, the Tao, so to speak, was the feeling of Jewish identity, right? Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, for again, almost 2,000 years, drummed into their heads this feeling of exilic despair, right? Um, some of it stemming from previous exiles, but like the Israeli national anthem, um, you know, says, looking to the east towards Zion, which echoes the psalm, which reflects the Jews being exiled to, to Babylon, you know, in 500 BC. And so there's this feeling of, 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 it, and it's odd because a land that they weren't even a part of, like nobody had been a part of for generations. And so it's like, that feeling of like belief, does that exist for these charter nations? And do you even need it? Maybe you don't. I've talked to some of the Prospera people, which is this thing in um, Honduras, that's like a special economic zone. They're like, you know, you don't really need a whole new country. You just need like special economic terms and the ability to move there. And that's all you need. Uh, so I've talked to a lot of these people yeah. as well. Uh, and when you think it's hilarious that we're talking about charter nation business, right? right. Uh, which is an important part of it as well. Uh, Cause you do need to make it sustainable. Um, and these, I think have gotten a lot of uh, attention because they are like planting a flag on the ground. Like we're going to create a special economic center. We're going to create a whole new city or a country right. or whatever. But like, there's also kind of watered down versions. I think right. uh, uh, there was the mountain uh, powder mountain or whatever that uh, uh, a whole group of people, they went and bought a mountain. They started to cut up all the, the land. They were selling these pieces uh, or plots or whatever. Uh, and they were going to like build like, basically a neighborhood, right? Like if, if you kind of right. think of like the, the most watered down version is right. like, hey, we're gonna go create a new neighborhood. You can also go try to create a new nation. But what I do think, we've like seen an example of this kind of play out in front of our eyes, which is Miami. Yeah. Which it actually had almost nothing to do with like the physical right. uh, infrastructure and all this. Like, yes, there were some things that were advantageous. But I think if you were to ask some of the people who moved here first, uh, they were just like, no, like we just like, there's 300 people. And if we could get those 300 people, it wouldn't even like, you, it was like somebody like you to fill this seat and we get 300 of them, then like we have momentum, we have like a, a nucleus and like we're off to the races and it is a higher probability of like escape velocity and like this will be a thing that will stay around for a long time. It feels like most of the other folks who are trying these like new nation things, it's more about the like physical location. It's more about like what are the rules than like just the people. And, and I don't know if you've thought at all about that in terms of like pros or cons between the difference. I mean, I've thought about Miami, right? Miami is almost its own little sort of city state. It feels weird. Like for those who, who don't spend time here, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but it feels very different than like Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. right? Fort very Lauderdale is great, nice airport to fly out of, but you, there's some sort of border you cross between Dade and Broward County when you yes. go north. And this is not like Orlando, <laughs> right? It's and nothing wrong with Orlando, but it's different. And like, I don't know, it, in, in my ideal world, there would be some like maritime Republic of Miami and Mayor Suarez is Doja. And it's like, it's, it's, it's like the Northern Italian city States. And it's just like this weird little place with its own laws. And, you know, I don't know. They'd be kind of cool. Frankly, I think we need more of those experiments. Like I, you know, a lot of these people, like the practice people, it's like, dude, why don't you just like, why don't you just take over a County in Florida? <laughs> just convince DeSantis now that he's like, you know, smacked around Disney, mm -hmm. <laughs> convince him to give you some county something. Or like even these retirement communities, like the villages, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they, they have like 200,000 people. They have like their own police force. It's like a whole city in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, 
you know, in Florida, so, you can. Well, what yeah. is the island? Uh, there's um, Fisher not, Island. Is it Fisher Island? No, there's a uh, 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 Indian Creek. Right, okay. is that? It, it's like super wealthy, right? Uh, yeah, you and yeah, I have yeah. never been there. Yeah, yeah, um, I've never been. And uh, <laughs> it's got like a golf course on it. There's like 30, 40, 50 homes, whatever it is. And they have like a thirteen person police force, and they patrol not by only land but also by sea. See? And they have like a boat and like and like the whole thing. And it's like, of course, you know, I think uh, uh, Jared Kushner and uh, Ivanka Trump bought a place there, and like, uh-huh. there's all these types of people, whatever. But you're like, okay, cool. It's not two hundred thousand people, but it's like fifty homes, and right. like. Again, they don't have special laws, but they sure as hell have an army that'll show up if you try to, like, you know, you try to get on the island. Right. And so, like, yeah, what is the difference between 40 homes and, you know, 100,000 homes? Like, I I don't know. It's not that big a difference. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but we should do these experiments. I think it'd be cool. What do you think is stopping it? Or what are the obstacles? Is it just, like, that sounds insane to the average person? Uh, I think people have – I don't know. I mean – or it takes hard work and somebody has to believe to be the first to, like, try it. Right. There has to be a sort of generative faith – in some future community that you're trying to build. There either has to be greed or faith. <laughs> Those are the two driving things. Like you have to believe in some national vil- you know, vision or just say, you know, I'm sick of taxes and these fucked up laws. I'm going to like make common cause with these 500 other rich people and do this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. The, uh, the thing that also jumps to mind is, uh, remember, uh, was it Clive Bundy? Remember in uh, was it uh, Nevada or Utah? It's like- Oregon, he, he, the Malheur thing, the, the, like the so guy, that, yeah, yeah. I think that was- uh, uh, after the original standoff, but uh, again, I don't want to get all the details wrong, but uh, essentially, I think his name's Clive Bundy. He's got like a huge, you know, geographic uh, area. Uh, I'll call it a farm or a ranch, but like <laughs> basically a city, right, in terms of size. And uh, the federal government came and was like, you know, eminent domain, like we're taking some of this or whatever. And he like called his buddies, I guess, and they like showed up with horses and guns. <laughs> and, and it was like a standoff. As one does. As and, one and, does. And I remember seeing on the news, like, you're like, holy shit, like these are like ranchers. And like, that looks like a SWAT sniper set up on the highway, like, you know, with a scope. And you're just like, is this, you know, the okay crap? Like, like, what is going on here? I don't think that anyone generally in the American public is like, that's what I'm willing to go do to right. like set up a, a new city. But like, it does become interesting if you go and you get a governor or some sort of uh, special treatment and they say, hey, you can try the experiment in this location. I think there's a lot of people who would say, yeah, I'll opt into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, particularly in the West, there's so many open spaces. So where my house is is in Story County outside of Reno, which is where Virginia City is, which used to be like the gold rush town. Mm-hmm. And there's, uh, I forget his name. Um, oh, it's the guy who founded Jet.com, one of these e-commerce. Mark Lore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think so he set up a city, right? Yeah, he tried yeah. to set up a city, to, and, which by the way, man, good luck to him because I live in the high desert. It is a harsh environment. <laughs> it gets, you're going to freeze your ass off in the winter and it gets hot as hell in the summer and it's a very harsh environment and there is much water and it's hard to live out there. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you can buy tens of thousands of acres for not much money in what in the Western Americas. And if you can convince people to move there, um, we'll see. But again, I think, and again, getting back to the Balaji conversation, he, he freely concedes that there, there needs to be a moral case made for the state. And, mm-hmm. and the weird thing that I've always tried to push Balaji on, it's like, dude, but what is the moral case? Tell me, what is the moral case for your network state? And he kind of talks around it doesn't, you know, I think he just doesn't see himself as that person maybe providing the moral what, cause. What but. do you think it should be? I don't know, man. It's, I don't know. I, I wrote this piece called uh, Side Thing on my experience in Judaism. I had this whole Judaism religious thing. Um, I think there's kind of like a God-shaped hole at the heart of a lot of secular liberalism. By God, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, God with a beard in the sky. I just mean some notion of transcendent good. To, you know, I think it was, um, um, I think it was not Walter Benjamin. Uh, who's the other guy? Anyhow, um, William James, the uh, Varieties of Religious Experience, who said, you know, the, at its core, religious sentiment is the belief that there's some sort of moral order towards which we should be striving, right? Mm-hmm. That there's some unseen moral good that we should arrange human affairs according to, right? Mm-hmm. And if you frame it that way, everything is religion, right? Literally, the traffic laws outside that say I can't park for longer than three hours are a form of religion because there's some greater parking good, right? That, again, empirically doesn't exist. There is no good, right? There's no good in the microscope. We invent these things, right? And so how, how do you invent a moral good that says, yes, we should have this, like, modern-day Hansi leagues of federated crypto cities governed by tokens. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. How do you make that case? It might just be a capitalist case of like, hey, there's lower taxes, things work better, move here. I don't know. 
What, yeah. what, what's funny is uh, the intersection of religion and new cities. Uh, I've always thought that actually the better way to try to do this in the United States, I don't think internationally uh, this uh, holds up, but in the United States, it's actually to take one of the pseudo religions, uh, take ESG and basically use that, which we do see companies like, uh, I think there's one called um, cul-de-sac, which is like, hey, we're going to build a city, but like there's no uh, streets for cars. It's like walkable only. There's no cars allowed, <laughs> like all this stuff. And like, actually, if you went to somebody in the government and was like, uh, we're anarchists, we're going to like take down, you know, whatever, we're going to like build our own thing or, or even a watered down version of like, we're building our own city with our own laws and, and taxes. They're like, uh, we're going to put you on a list somewhere and like, we're going to watch you guys and like, that's not allowed. But if you show up and you're like, hey, we're going to build a new city and uh, psst, no cars are allowed. They're like, oh, great. How much money do you need? Like, well, what land do you want? You know, and, and like, there's a conversation. What's the difference? Like, yeah. Moral good, no cars. Uh, it does feel like there's like this whole world Car- where- Carbon like, zero is the new moral good, man. That is the the new moral good towards, towards, towards we should be striving. There are people who are uh, are headed that way. Um, another thing that's interesting to me is uh, this new world. Uh, is, so you take like uh, network stakes or whatever. Uh, a lot of times are critiques on the old world. Uh, but we do see in the technology world, like it seems that some of the new world is just recreating problems of the old world. Yeah. So if you look, uh, DAOs- Well, crypto's one, by the way. <laughs> that's exactly where it's, we're going. It's, yeah. uh, so DAOs, uh, somebody recently pitched me uh, on this like DAO thing. And I was like, ah, I don't know. Like, what, what, what is your DAO got that's so special? And he's like, well, let me explain. One of the problems in DAOs is that uh, there's a lot of people and there's no like structure. And so you, nobody really knows what anyone's working on. And there's like no strategy and all stuff. So we have this concept. Uh, we're going to- to create sub DAOs inside of the DAO. And I was ah. like, what do you mean? And they were like, well, like all the product people are going to be in one sub DAO to work on product <laughs> <laughs> and marketing. And I was like, so divisions in a company. Uh, yeah. And like, again, I get it. There's tons and tons of people right. out there. And one anecdote does not necessarily uh, kind of right. sentence all of them to like, this is stupid. But I literally was like, this, like, where's the hidden camera? Like, this has got to be a joke that like, you're literally describing a corporation to me right. just using DAO instead. Right. And I think that the critics of the uh, broad crypto industry uh, would say like, hey, that's just like one example. Like there's a hundred others of just recreating the problems or recreating some of these things. How do you think through like some of the the, the naiveness or like right. the, the, the stupidity that goes? Well, I wouldn't call it stupidity, but um, yeah. Some I mean, of it is stupid. Well, some, yeah. some of it is not. Some of it. Harsh words, Pomp. Harsh words. <laughs> come, uh, on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> By the way, I've talked to people and been like, that sounds kind of crazy. And they're like, yeah, we know it's stupid, but right. So like it can be a lovable <laughs> thing as well. I mean, I think the fact that, like, for example, DeFi is speedrunning a lot of the problems of, like, conventional 19th and 20th century finance is probably a good sign in a way. It's like you've had bank runs, you've had speculative bubbles, like, oh, like the entire history of the stock market basically for the past century and a half. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of dumb to be stepping on the exact same landmines that the previous world did. Ideally, you could kind of avoid that. Part of what my company hopes to do is like, okay, let's not do the stupidity of Web2 attribution again. Like, let's just get to the real answer. Um, on the other hand, I don't know, man. Yeah, look, I so... I just got to this party, so to speak, so it's hard for me to sit here in judgment. But it it does strike me that there's a lot of interesting energy and innovation going on in Web3 and crypto, and then a lot of things that are, like, super naive and, like, whoa, you've never had, like, a real job before, have you? (laughs) You've never been inside, like, a real tech company and seen how the sausage is made, have you? Um, And, again, that's both good and bad, right? That, That can mean that you can invent new stuff and, like, yeah, you don't give a shit how it was built before. On the other hand, it's, like... You invented an organization chart. <laughs> <laughs> it is um, true. But, but, but I think it's important also. It, it can be an v- amazing thing because right. you're going to get people with new ideas who, frankly, don't know that they shouldn't try something or whatever right. and like, right. get breakthroughs. Exactly. Yeah. But then also the other side is the, the crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, specifically in my example, just to cut to it, right? So just raise money. I guess this is my – well, I've said it before, but whatever. Um, raise money for a company that's uh, in Web3 attribution and user acquisition. And for those who don't know what that means, a lot of people in Web3 don't. I've had to explain it. It's like, you know, you do a token drop. What's the ROI on that? <laughs> was it worth was it? Well, worth hold on. It? Let's just go to Web2. For, ex- sure. Explain kind of like how uh, these Web2 companies, so yeah, yeah. Facebooks, Twitters, yeah. Googles, all these stuff. Like many people, I think outside of the tech industry will be like, oh, Facebook's amazing. Like uh, I get on their software, I connect with people and like they don't realize like, no, literally somebody is watching. Did you right. click or not? What color is the button? Like uh, when I was at Facebook, I remember uh, the create page button on Facebook, if you go, I'm assuming it's still there, uh, is green. Every other button on Facebook's 
blue, but that one's fucking green. Right. And people, there was a huge debate. Like, Increased click through rate 10%. <laughs> yeah. Can, can, can we make it green? Like, does it violate our design standards? Like, all this stuff. And, like, guess what? We showed up and we were like, look at the click through rate. And, like, here's data. And people were like, well, fuck the design standard. Like, make that shit green because that's the top of the funnel to make money. Right. right, right. And so, like, explain a little bit as to, like, attribution yeah. and, like, how some of this yeah. stuff happens in the, in the old world. Right. And so, just to be clear, when Facebook is watching you, it's not Zuck sitting, like, literally sitting there laughing at the, at the DM to your girlfriend. <laughs> Just because like, people seem as like, yes, Zuck is sitting there and listening to what you're saying right now and making a joke at your expense. It's like, obviously, it's it's much more high level. It's aggregated. Yes. There's no individual much of anything going on. Yeah. So so the funnel, you, you said a lot there, actually. Right. So like, what is the funnel? So the funnel, obviously, wide on top, narrow at the bottom. And it's the central metaphor for like everything and almost everything in Web2 and marketing. Right. Mm -hmm. Seen from a very mercenary point of view. Every company is actually a marketing company with like a little side hustle. Like a game company is actually a mark, and this is actually true. Most game companies are actually marketing companies yes. that happen to just create games to have a thing to sell. And how they navigate that funnel, and what, what does it mean to navigate the funnel? So what's at the top of the funnel? Top of the funnel is things like Facebook posts, Instagram posts, tweets, random browsing on the internet, the, the very high level touch surface of, of your media experience. I mean, in the real world, it's seeing billboards, listening to a, this podcast, whatever it is, right? Then you go further into the funnel, right? You've, you've responded to some call to action. You've clicked on a thing. You've installed an app, right? CTA, to use the, the term of art. Um, you've installed the app, right? So you're kind of mid-funnel. Like, you, you might convert, right? Note the religious language. When you buy a thing, you convert. It's like Mormons, <laughs> like, trying to save your soul, right? This is capitalism is transcendent, speaking of organizing principles. That's, that's where we've gotten to. The only thing we believe <laughs> yes. in is capitalism. Um, and then you get deeper into the funnel. You're in the app. You upgrade to the paid plan. You buy the NFT, you do whatever it is, ka-ching, the cash register goes off. How do you join all that shit, <laughs> right? Because I've mentioned like three or four different platforms or, or more than that that it's happening. How does the person, you running the pages team or whatever at Facebook or me with the exchange or the, like how do you or somebody inside a, a DeFi exchange now, how does how do you actually think, how do I figure all that out? That's and, and, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to understand, okay, we reached at the very top of the funnel. Somebody somewhere saw something about us and that was a million people. Right. How many of those million people then went to the right. like uh, website? Then right. how many of the website clicked? click the button and then right. how many people bought and right. can we then start to tweak? Well, if a million people saw it and only 40% came through, can we get it to 50%, 60% right. And, right. and actually move the metrics? Right. So those are the high level analytics. So that, and then, so there's, there's a lot going. And then there's like a, a compute step, which is like, who do we give credit for the, for the conversion? And I had like, in my pitch deck, I had like a joke, apocryphal quote actually from Stalin that said, you know, who votes in an election doesn't matter, who counts the votes matters, right? And in attribution, it's also true. Da 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 <laughs> dangerous in today's day and age. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> You know, who clicks and where kind of doesn't matter. Who counts the clicks is what matters, yes. right? So I always cite the example. I also had this slide in the deck, by the way, and Jason Calacanis, who we all know and love, not really. But um, <laughs> no, we do we do love him despite his many personality flaws. Um, um, I love you, Jason. <laughs> you can come on anytime. <laughs> and you and Antonio, I'll gladly sit here and just shut up and let you guys talk. <laughs> He's going to come up and give you a hug and then make a tweet at your expense like he did with Palmer. But anyhow, um, <laughs> um, in any case, um, I, I just just, just I just, myself. Just, what the fuck listen, was I talking listen, about? Just, oh, just, know, hold on, hold on, <laughs> just, just know for a second that uh, uh, Jason, I know he's in pain because I've seen him tweet like multiple times now. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the All In uh, podcast, which is excellently yeah, yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, uh, they continue just to crank out great content. Uh, but now there's been a couple of times where either Chamath or David Sachs has worn something on the show. So okay. like a uh, Hat, or I think one of them had like a sweater and these are like high end brands. Okay. And, uh, because the all in podcast audience is insane, they go right. and they start buying that thing and they're like selling out. Like literally there's like <laughs> some random elite sweater that like is sold out. And now Wait, no you, can you tell me David Tax is wearing like a Louis Vuitton baseball cap with the symbols and shit on it. No like way. Some, something <laughs> like that. I forget what the brand was. And like the hat sold out. No one could find it. And so of course, like somebody goes and they screenshot it and they're like, Hey, you know, all in, uh, folks, uh, you guys are like, you know, uh, uh, driving all these sales and she's just like are you kidding me we created this podcast and now we can't monetize it but yet we're like driving sales to all this other shit and so he is in pain right now even though they are having the success of the podcast the fact that they won't let him monetize it is uh him excruciatingly uh sitting there saying like this is a missed opportunity man that's such a weird thing i have actually spoken at the all in summit actually i debated ben, ben greenwald in ukraine at their thing and what an odd bunch of characters it is. <laughs> <laughs> i love it i listen every week and i think that uh uh it, it is uh exactly the thing that was missing for a lot of people is like they're like okay like what are like some of the people who are not media people yeah. uh talking about and 
most of the time people have tried to create that. Like there's no trust. So then nobody says anything interesting. These guys are just like teeing off on each other, which I think makes it work. It's super amusing. But if you got locked in an elevator with those four, you'd like kill yourself. So yeah, 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 yeah. After, after enough time. <laughs> All right. Attribution. Sorry, getting back to attribution. Sorry. I don't know. How fucking see, look, this is Jason laughing. See, look, he, he's, just, he's completely derailed your podcast. Well, you know what he's doing? He's counting this as top of funnel marketing. Top of funnel for, marketing. For, for, so getting back to marketing. Um, right. Getting back to marketing. Um, so I, I, I actually cited this example in the pitch deck. I, in Nevada, I go mountain biking, my little e-bike, I, you know, I got convinced to buy one of these e-bike things, which are super cool, by the way. I'm part of the e-bike revolution. I think e-bikes are is amazing. Is e-biking, do you pedal at all? Or literally yeah, no, you do, all? but it's like a boost. So right. if you're like not in the most amazing shape, like I'm not, and you're going up and down hills, it makes it like super fun. Got it. And um, I, where I am is super hill. Like I basically, you couldn't mountain bike this unless you're in exceptional shape. Got it. And so this makes it such that someone who's not in exceptional shape can actually do it. And it's kind of fun and cool. And it's like, it's a cool gizmo and it. Anyhow, um, so I just posted a photo of it and like, oh, cool, like from where I ride or whatever. And then J. Cal pipes in, oh, that's cool. What is that, man? Tell me. And someone like tells him the model name with like a review. Fuck it. He goes and buys it. If you go to Jason's like page now, he mountain bikes. He has my exact same bike, Specialized Turbo Levo or whatever, which is a great bike. And if you ask, okay, do the attribution problem. So who takes credit? Like these things cost like, by the way, like I bought the entry level, which is like six or seven K. They go up to like 20, 25 K, these damn things. So who knows what model he bought? So who gets credit for like the several thousand dollar bike? Is it me using presumably my influencer audience? Is it Twitter? No, no, almost certainly it's Google. Cause I'm sure Jason, you know, didn't go to specialized.com. He just like specialized Turbo Levo. And then, you know, Google acts navigationally, but it takes, if there was an attribution system there run by Google, of course, they would take full credit for yep. that attribution, even though, causally, they didn't actually add that much to the thing. And so that's the magic of attribution. You, d you determine what is the ground truth. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, that ground truth, and this is the, the brave new world of, of Web3, would be a little bit more tied to like real causality in the world because the way, where we've arrived in Web2 with a lot of this funnel stuff, it's very sophisticated, a lot of it. A lot of it is also very mythological, right? A seven-day attribution window for app installs. Why seven days? You're telling me if I go seven days and an hour later, it, it's not causally related, but six hour, you know, six days and 23 it is? You know, it's kind of like a made-up thing. That's not really how it should work, right? And so um, at this point, it's like congealed into a, a system, the way that Web2 works, and it's this machine, right? You, you target people with a message to some level of accuracy. They come in. You learn new things because they buy things. You retarget them, there's this whole flywheel, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can figure out how to get your LTVs above your CACs, i.e. your lifetime value above your customer acquisition costs, to use the terms of art, then you've got a, a positive fraction and you're gold, then you've got some ROI target, and you're and if you can't and you run out of money, you lose. And that mm -hmm. that is basically that is the core. That is literally how that, like that is literally how half, of the, half or more of the technology yes. industry works yes. is like, <laughs> give me money, I light it on fire, but if I get more back and then it's like a thing that I spend a dollar to get to, I'll do that all day long and it'll just light more right. and more money on fire. But if I on the outside chance that I light the money on fire and none comes back, then I'm fucked. Right, right, right. <laughs> right? And like, that's literally the game. Right. What you have to create in marketing and in ad tech is a machine where I put in a dollar and I get out a buck 30. <laughs> and if that's true, then I'll be doing this all day. And if it isn't, it's just like, oh, nothing came out. It's just gone. And that's it. I'm out of money now. Right. Like that is how all of Web2 <laughs> mm -hmm. most and, of Web2 And ones. to be clear, one of the reasons why so many investors have gone and bought Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook stock, et cetera, is because uh, who are you putting the money into the machine? <laughs> it's usually Facebook, Amazon, Google. Right. And they're sitting there saying like, maybe you get a dollar 30 or maybe you get zero, but like, we're just the machine and like it's somewhat on you to be able right. to figure out how to use our machine correctly to get the right and there's this whole stack of technology that sits on top of these players that makes sure or tries to make sure that you get a buck 30 out of the machine instead of 80 cents mm -hmm. right um and so what's the problem here right that doesn't exist in crypto and web3 right mm -hmm. and like if you want a billion real people actually using web3 the reality is a, you're going to have to like drink the Web2 user milkshake, right? And basically take users from Web2, like Web2 and Web3, there's never going to be like a flip over moment. Obviously, they're going to coexist for years from now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of, I suspect in the future, a lot of people will be using crypto not even realizing it. Yes. Oh, it's like, oh, I have some cool new experience. You know, I don't know how it magically works that like the same shit I bought on this game works on that game, but somehow I actually own it and it just works. Right? Uh, I was asking you, I say, uh, explain to me Google's tech stack. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and like, what protocol does it run on? And they have no clue. And it's no like, crap. that's where we have to get to. Right. Uh, and I actually even think with Bitcoin to some degree, like there's uh, a number of ones uh, strike and these other companies have popped up and it's like, uh, it, can I send you dollars across the Bitcoin network. Like, you don't know if you're using Visa or MasterCard. Right. Well, Visa, MasterCard, Bitcoin, right. like, who cares? And so uh, getting there is going to be pretty important for a lot of these technologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
And again, I understand, you know, tribalism and geekery is what it is, but like all this chain love and the tribalism of like Solana versus Ethereum, it's like, dude, it's like caring about, um, you know, whether your favorite tech company uses like Amazon or Google virtual servers, like who gives a shit? You don't care and you shouldn't care, right? Only the salespeople <laughs> at those two companies care because they're going to get attribution of the sale and they can get right. paid. <laughs> right, 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 right. And so, yeah, the idea here is how do we create that system for a blockchain led world, which is very different. Like Web3, in my opinion, again, I just got to this party, so to speak, but is like the inverse of Web2 in all sorts of interesting ways. Why? Um, well, I mean, getting to this funnel business, right? Um, in Web two, when you when you build these systems, and I've built these systems buy side sell side at every level of sophistication and scale, from tiny YC startup to Facebook, right? A lot of the complexity, the ad ranking, the serving, the optimization, the track, all that shit is happening top of funnel, like at the Facebook level, mm -hmm. and the downstream attribution, like the event, like oh you bought a thing, you bought a hundred dollar thing, okay great, but that's like, I mean it's important, but it's not that interesting to model. Like it's literally an event fired from like your Facebook mm -hmm. app to SDK mm -hmm. to Facebook saying. They bought thing one, two, three, four, and it costs five dollars. Like that's it. Right. Web web three, and again, like as far as I know, we're like one of the few companies doing it. So and we're just figuring it out. A lot more of the complexity is down funnel, right? Like modeling Uniswap's ARPU <laughs> is kind of hard. Right. It's like, oh, there's this 0.3% swap rate, but then 0.05% is in this governor's token that they give back, which by the way, whose value is fluctuating like more wildly than the fucking NASDAQ. Um, you know, and, uh, what is the ARPU? What was the acquisition cost? What is their total monetization? Right. These aren't easy questions to answer, right? And while the upstream side of things to the extent there even is any, it's like, well, if these wallet got the uni drop, like that's it. So one of the things, uh, speaking of like recreating the world, right, that, that we were talking about earlier, uh, is yield farming it was massive right. and, and uh, has tapered off a little bit, but it still exists. And uh, for those that don't know, or kind of the elementary explanation was basically like somebody be like, hey, cool, I'm gonna create a coin. And uh, that coin is associated with a protocol right. and that protocol uh, has some amazing dream of doing A, B, C, D, whatever. Uh, but I have a problem. I wrote the code, I have the uh, protocol Usually it's just a fork of something or, or taking some open source code and just copying it. Uh, but nobody knows I exist. How do I get people to come use it? Right. And so what a bunch of the people did is like, well, let's create coins. Okay, we got a bunch of coins. What do we do with the coins? Well, let's take a portion of those coins and we'll give them to people if they come and they use it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay. So the users are sitting there saying like, wait, there's free money. And so they show up and they're like, cool, what do you want me to do? And there's always some crazy thing like, well, buy some of our coins and then like stake them, say you won't spend them. And then you'll like earn a thousand percent APY. But there's only so many coins available for people to do this. And so the more people who join, the lower the uh, return gets. And so naturally what occurred is, well, guess who was coming first? It's like the mercenaries, not the missionaries. They don't give a shit about your product. They just want the return. It gets commoditized down to some level. And then they just move on to the next right. one. Now, a huge piece of that is these projects we're essentially doing this, which is like, right. that is a customer acquisition cost that they don't know. Of course, yeah. They have no clue where those people came from. Yeah. Uh, and they have no clue how to remarket to them. Like all the yeah. problems you're talking about. And there was, I'm going to put in big, big air quotes, billions of dollars here yeah. because they sometimes, usually, uh, almost always were like invented dollars, coins, right. whatever. Uh, but still, it's a big business, whether people think it's sustainable or not. And there was no data around it. Yeah, you know, it's right. <laughs> When I first started looking at yield farming, it's like, I, I couldn't get my head around. It's like, wait, no, no, I, I understand it. There's just very little to understand. Right? <laughs> like if you've got a diagram in which you're not either creating value or there's an exogenous arrow called money coming in this way, then you're kind of in some sort of weird Ponzi like. Uh, environment and but I mean it's it's wild right, <laughs> it's right. And, and 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 again like put aside for a second uh uh is it a Ponzi is it not what whatever but just like if you are an investor like let's say you're a crypto VC that's like investing in these things uh what do they put in the investor update <laughs> Right, like, like there's no, Number there's no up. measurement, there's no date. Like, it has to just be about. Token uh, well, no, it, but it's like super elementary stuff. Like, here's how many people are staking, right? And it, and it's like so surface level. It's uh, an engagement. It's like it's like the is sort of. I mean, yeah, it's it's weird, right? Like, you're basically firing money out of a cannon and hopefully, like, hoping somebody picks up the ten dollar bill and like walks in the store, right? Yeah. And of course, almost everyone just walk doesn't even walk in the store. But it's basically kind of free money, so you don't care, right? It's like. Yes. I, you know, when money is free, acquisition costs are zero, <laughs> definitionally, yes. and you just don't care. But then what happens when money stops being free, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and you have the crypto crash, and suddenly... So how do you guys think about, like, the attribution? I guess, like, what is the overlap with uh, kind of the legacy world? Like, what are the things from that world that you think you can port over yeah. versus, like, what are, like, new things you yeah, think yeah, you have yeah. to figure out? Yeah, I mean, you're right to frame it in two different ways, right? So, again, there's, there's the Web 2 versus Web 3 
attribution problem, and then there's like the sort of endogenous Web3 like problem. The native stuff. The native, yeah. right. So if, if you talk to a lot of Web3 companies, we've talked to lots of Web3 companies, a lot of them are actually doing conventional Web2 user acquisition buys. Like they, they buy ads on Facebook and, yes. and YouTube. And, you know, they're fairly untargeted. They're using a lot of the ad exchanges targeting. They come to the wallet sign-in page. They sign in. And then that's it. Like the trail goes cold. They don't actually join anything from, and for those who don't know, on the Web2 side, there's a whole, and again, it's all privacy, GDPR compliant, et cetera, but there's a whole tracking mechanism there through the click link and cookies and device fingerprinting that basically, if you click on a Facebook ad and arrive on a landing page, they know it's you and that you came from Facebook ad one, two, three, four. But it doesn't stop there. And I think there's a, a key right. piece to it is like, let's say that uh, I was running ads to a Shopify store. Right. Uh, then they know that, cool, you hit the homepage, you clicked on two products, you didn't buy those, you went to a third product Correct. page, and then you converted. Yeah. And then they realize like, okay, everyone who clicks on those two product pages Correct. and then converts, we probably should go show those two product pages at the front of the website right. to get higher conversion right. rate. And, and the way that works is those events that were down from the landing page whether they were an in-app or on a web experience, they were firing SDK events, and mm -hmm. SDK is just like a tracking package, basically, back to Facebook saying, this user, in an anonymous way, did this thing, and so Facebook can actually join all those things together. When I was at Facebook, I mean, probably when you were at Facebook, a little bit later, so it was, but when I was at Facebook, most of the time, there was no attribution system. You looked yes. away from Facebook, and Facebook had no idea what the hell was going on. In fact, some of the products they built were the first time that you could actually see outside of Facebook, yes. and that's when Facebook ads started getting good, because you could actually detect that. The problem is that Web3 right now is stuck in like Facebook to circa 2012 land in which there's like this basically great wall between the Web2 data trail and the Web3 data trail. And it's really odd because the, because downstream on the blockchain, there's all sorts of data being written, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of this gets into the whole privacy angle, which is a whole other conversation we can have, which is that Web3 is weird in that everything that actually happens is in a public ledger. Hard to query because, I mean, the blockchain is fascinating from anything. It's a terrible user data store. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to do a lot of repivoting and querying of data to actually get at it, but everything is stored. But of course, everything is anonymous and everything upstream of the blockchain is completely unknown. So, you know, one of the first things we're going to work on is actually joining, joining those two things. Together. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not that hard to do. It's non-trivial, but you, you're going to have to have, if Web3 is going to succeed and again, have a billion real people on it, it's going to have to get into the sort of iterative flywheel of targeting people on Web2. They come in, they convert on chain, things happen, you learn new things, you retarget them on Web2, they come back in. Like, you need that cycle. Without that cycle, Web3 is not going to succeed. So the whole idea here, uh, in the most primitive uh, sense, is get people into this new world, yes. understand who they are, either retarget them or people who look like them, Facebook look like audiences. That'd be uh, amazing. I mean, imagine lookalikes in the blockchain, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the people... Until you understand how the ad systems work, I don't think people quite no. realize. Like, uh, the, Facebook looks like audience is a great example. You can take a email list and you can feed it into Facebook and you can say to Facebook, do you know right. who the people who use these email addresses are on Facebook? Right. And there's a whole bunch of reasons how they may know or what their Facebook profiles are Definitely. or whatever. And they say, cool, we have put 100,000 emails in. We've now identified 30,000 of, of the users. Right. Those 30,000 people, can you go through and strip all the similarities? So uh, mail, location, income, job, high school, what, all this stuff. Cool. Now can you find a bunch of other people that look like those people right. on the internet based on those priorities? And you come up with, you started with an email list. Now you come up with a whole different set of people that you can go target that likely are similar to those folks. Right. And you can go do that. There's none of that going on here. Yeah. But in some ways, there's more data. Right, right. And, and just to... Stress your point even more. Lookalikes are probably one of the most underreported, underrated, but most successful Facebook ads products ever. Yes. I didn't work on it when I was there, but I remember the guy who first pitched it. And at first I'm like, oh, I don't know, sounds kind of cool. It could work. It works amazingly well because one of the biggest pain points, and Web3 isn't there yet, but it will get there, is that if you talk to Web2, if you go to the QBR business meeting as the PM and you go talk to the big retailer who gets the PM FaceTime, they're like, they're like we're smart. We have an in-house marketing team. We know how to reach all of our audience at whatever the, the actual match rate is at every outlet, including you, Google, everybody else. I've got this million, the set of million golden whales. Find me another million just like them. That's the one thing you can uniquely solve. And if you ask the questions like, oh, how is Facebook monetizing my data? They're not fucking listening to your phone. They don't give a shit about what you wrote to your girl. They don't give any about any of that fucking shit, right? That, that's, it's just ridiculous. I don't give a fuck about if any of that If you got cash, though, they're interested <laughs> right. what they, what in they you care, buying. What they care about is like you're the guy who just, you're like the guy who just dropped $400 on an REI tent and you guys chat all the time. You know each other. That's important, right? Yes. Then you can be foreign part of, look, or it turns out your politics are very like similar to somebody else's or whatever the case might be. That's where your Facebook data actually gets used in terms of the similarity metric between people users. And so, yeah, at some point in, in the blockchain, hopefully sooner you, rather than so later. So you think that that will definitely oh, yeah. be a thing that happens? 
Look like audience with a similarity metric among wallets in, in block. I'm, I'm shocked if there isn't somebody working on it. We're probably going to end up working on it at some point. Yeah and, yeah. and so let's just go through a very elementary example here, right? So uh, let's say that person A has a wallet. They've got uh, certain types of NFTs in there. They've done certain on-chain activities, and maybe they have uh, a bunch of uh, Bitcoin and other assets, whatever. You can basically go look at that and then almost score it to some degree right. and then compare it to other wallets right. and then find, okay, what other wallet has the same NFT, same kind of balance between certain types of assets, and a certain activity right. uh, trail. And then, okay, these two wallets uh, are different people, we believe, but they actually are very similar. And so if this person did something with you, maybe this person's interested. That's right. How do you then go and, and find who that person is or communicate or market to them? Well, I mean, if you're using the Web3 tools, a few that exist, it's like, oh, let's hit them with an NFT or a token rep, which again, like, I know a lot of people- So you get, just airdrop them. Yeah, you airdrop, like, which it's funny. I talk about ads in Web3, people get shocked. It's like, dude, you've already got ads in Web3. <laughs> like NFT is an ad. Like if you define an ad as- a piece of paid media that prompts a user action, which include lots of things, we already have ads in Web3. And so like in Web3, that's the only targeting mechanism you have due to this weirdness that you can send things to random wallets. But again, if you were to join Web2 with Web3, you could hit them on Web2 as well, right? I mean, I'm curious how creepy people would find this. Here's a, we're going to float the idea. You buy a thing on chain and you get retargeted for that inside your Instagram feed, right? Imagine that, which happens commonly in Web2 as it is, right? Instagram ads have sky high click-through rates because the ads are actually really well targeted. Imagine doing that with blockchain data, right? That, that would change the game. And which, and again, it would be good for new user acquisition, what's called prospecting, like new users coming into user thing, and also re-engagement. One of the biggest problems you have is like someone who comes in, uses the app, they get bored, they churn out, right? Like the end of the funnel is usually a terminus, like they churned out and they're gone. Mm -hmm. You've got to re-engage them. You know they like your product to a certain degree. Maybe you have to hit them with a different offer. Maybe they just forgot and they have a new device and they didn't download your app. You mm -hmm. have to re-hit them, right? Like again, this is just like the bread and butter of how Web2 growth works. Mm -hmm. And Web3 has very, very little of it right now. What do you think are the the downsides or the risks here? Like, is it just is everyone's privacy? Wallet, they're just going to get fucking spammed with a million airdrops and like yeah, but then they'll be yeah, but there'll be a tool that basically scrubs all that shit from your wallet automatically, and you'll be fine with it, right? Like mm -hmm. that that's just the arms race of how these things go. I mean, I think privacy is interesting. So I, privacy is one thing we thought about. I've actually I did a Substack post about it. Um, that's another place where like Web two and Web three are totally inverted, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. In Web two, it's mostly the real unless you're like an anon account, it's the real you online. But then what you do financially and commercially, everything else is kind of private and. It's actually heavily regulated. Web3, it's the opposite, right? Everything you do is public, which is odd, but the real you is at least pseudonymous, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, if Amazon went and published on a public ledger everything you bought there, <laughs> you would have a fucking meltdown, <laughs> right? And yet somehow, by default, that's how Web3 works, and everybody is cool with it. It's, Weirdos! <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and um, I've always thought that does Amazon have like a weirdo score, right? Like, like just Sure, if you buy groceries, <laughs> if you buy, you know, books, whatever, like you're you're in one category and then they're just like, oh, well, these people, listen, look at what they're fucking buying. Today's episode is brought to you by Alto IRA. Have you wanted to buy Bitcoin or over 200 other cryptocurrencies in your retirement account? Well, now you can with Alto IRA. They allow you to buy Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in a tax advantaged way. There's no account or setup fees, and it's super simple to get started. You can go today to altoira.com slash pomp to get started. AltoIRA.com slash POMP. Invest in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in your retirement account and get all the tax advantages while still holding digital currencies. AltoIRA.com slash POMP. I mean, I'm sure, they've re I'm sure they had one, but they renamed it. In the same way that <laughs> Facebook used to have the stalker coefficient, which was a simulator, and now that you guys are like, no, 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 it's just coefficient. It's not stalker coefficient. <laughs> How many times someone looked at your page? Um, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird. How do you merge those worlds, right? And if you look at, to get wonky for a second, if you look at things like GDPR and CCBA and privacy regulation, there's, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to comply with that and how, and the blockchain just basically flies in the face of GDPR. Yeah. So how do you actually reconcile those two worlds as you will? And that, is, is, that a risk, is that a risk for some of these uh, oh, yeah. networks where uh, GDPR is weaponized to basically call the bluff on like, are you decentralized or not? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and dude, I, people will like doubt it, but I will be saying I told you so in five years, like crypto and privacy are like these two trains that are headed on the same track towards each other. Mm -hmm. And the only question is how far apart they are before they collide. Um, I've, I've thought about this a lot from the Bitcoin <laughs> perspective of like, it, again, let's hold the assumption, which I think 99.9% .9 of people agree, uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. All of these things that uh, are like, oh, you can't do that, or this is the rules, or this or whatever. Like at the end of the day, it's just a decentralized thing that there is nobody who runs it, and like the uh, fact that the founder is unknown walked away, and there's, you have a decentralized network, like kind of checks the boxes. A lot of question marks on everything else, and I think that GDPR, like I hadn't thought about that being one of the things that kind of sniffs oh, yeah. out, like what is actually decentralized and what isn't. Yeah, because at a high level, 
GDPR is surprisingly readable. You can just go read the thing, although it's very vague. There, there are two key points to GDPR. One is who owns the data, right? And mm-hmm. like basically who takes the liability bullet? Who gets dragged to Brussels when you fucked up, basically? Mm-hmm. And there's two positions. There's a controller and a processor, and there's different terminology in CCPA, but it's the same thing. It's basically first party and third party. So if if you know, if again, I don't know why I keep on citing REI, but if you're REI and you buy there, they have a first party relationship with you. If I'm their attribution system or Google Analytics, I'm a I'm a I'm a processor, not a controller. And so the rules are slightly different. You can't get away with murder just because you're the processor, but it's a little bit different. You want to be a processor rather than a controller, by and large. And then there's also the sort of deletion immutability side of it. And there's a bunch there. But basically, at the end of the day, if you want your data gone, modulo some restrictions, and there are some restrictions, you can have it go away, right? So does that mean that every single blockchain is violating GDPR? Oh, a lot of them probably are, yeah. Without, well, it's just yeah. every single one of them probably, uh, right? If, well, if you can't, if you can't if, delete your data. If, if Well, if personal data is on the chain to begin with. like the, yeah. So step one is don't put personal data on the, on the chain, mm-hmm. right? And so what does it mean to delete? Could it be the case that you encrypt it and burn the private key? Is that deleting? Could be. Um, from my reading on it, in, the, in some jurisdictions, that would count as deleting, and some it wouldn't. The problem with GDPR is that it's, A, it's worded very vaguely, and so it's basically left... I'm sure that wasn't intentional. Yeah, I'm sure that wasn't intentional. <laughs> and then it has to be decided by legal precedent, and there's very little, there's no precedent, almost no precedent in the case of blockchain. But yeah, if you've got personal data on the blockchain, you're basically in violation. And then not only that, there's restrictions around moving data you know, overseas, obviously, and if it is decentralized, you've got these nodes all over the place. Um, and this is not even going into content moderation, things like CSAM, i.e. kitty porn, you know, violent material, I, the news came out that uh, ISIS put an NFT <laughs> on, I forget what chain, I think it was Ethereum, um, and there's no way to get rid of it now. Or no, no, it was uh, IPFS, I think. IPFS. Wait, what did they do? I didn't see this. Uh, Wall Street, I have no direct experience, it was just the Wall Street Journal thing that I read, but apparently ISIS put some sort of recruitment NFT, whatever that means, on, I think it was IPFS. Yeah. I mean... I'm scared to uh, <laughs> e- even think about this, but like, what do they got? Like a fucking image of like, dude. No, it gets worse. So I was talking. I was in a debate with uh, Alex uh, Stamos, who's the head of the Stanford Internet Observatory, yep. former head of security at, at our former employer. Um, and I kind of floated the thoughts, like, yeah, what if someone puts uh, like child sexual abuse material, which is obviously horrible, on chain? What would you do? And he's like, oh no, it's already happened. And I forget. I, I I don't know. I didn't check his references, but he's a pretty informed guy, so I'm sure he wasn't talking out of his ass. Someone apparently has put like horrible stuff on chain. So there was a story. Uh, I think it was the uh, on Ethereum. Uh, I'm, I hope I get these details right. Uh, there was a woman who was involved in some sort of sexual assault uh, or sexual harassment case in China, or it was the woman's friend. I can't remember which one, but somebody that had uh, understanding of the details. Uh, and it was basically getting kind of quieted, wasn't a lot of coverage of it, whatever. They took the details, they put it on the blockchain as like an immutable ledger. Uh, and so like, you know, censor me now uh, type uh, kind of calling the bluff. Um, when I saw that, I was shocked that we hadn't seen that over and over and over again since. And I'm sure there's been some cases, but people don't talk about it or whatever. Uh, but yeah, you can extend this to like way more extreme things than just like, Hey, I have words that nobody, uh, wants to get out. Um, and if you're running a node, that material is on your machine, right? Think about that. (laughs) And and so like, yeah, like what happens then? You're not a lawyer. Neither am I. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Neither one of us slept at, uh, uh, Hampton Inn, but like, (laughs) (laughs) all right, I, I, I assume if you are a politician or in law enforcement and you want to make a dent, you probably go towards the notes, right? I guess so. But how do you track them down and, uh. Yeah, there's a bunch of complexity. Jurisdictions are in, yeah. Of course, right? So, like, decentralization, again, becomes really right. fucking important here. Right. Um, and, and I guess it also begs the question of, like, GDPR, uh, I think a lot of people are like, oh, this is annoying. I have to collect, you know, hit, uh, accept all cookies every single right. time I go to a website in, in Europe or whatever. But at the same time, like, GDPR is probably, like, the watered-down version of, like, some of this other stuff. And so could they then start to shut down all these blockchains uh, or a lot of them because you only need one violation for the entire thing to be kind of out of step? Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit in the policy world through the Lincoln Network, which is this, this DC thing. Um, what, what is the Lincoln Network? Uh, so Lincoln Network, which, by the way, is not the Lincoln Project, just to get that out of the way. It's a completely <laughs> different organization, just to be clear. <laughs> unrelated, unrelated organizations. Let's just get that straight. I'm assuming there's been some uh, accusations given the uh, the need to clarify. Um, when, when someone mistakes the two, I, I see the director's soul kind of shrivel and die every single time. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a think tank, um, nonpartisan, um, although obviously pro-business, pro-tech, that tries to bring together like actual tech practitioners with policy in DC, Got which it. is like this yawning lacuna that exists that Super should be easy. reconciled. And so, um, yeah, I help them out because, you know, I, I think, look, uh, DC is going to exist. Regulation is going to come in some form or another. At this point, you know, GDPR is real. And so better to inform it rather than have it off in la la land. Yep. Um, and so 
you know, it's weird that like they're still fighting the Facebook fight to like the shit we worked on 10 years ago, <laughs> right? Becomes like the media thing five years after and then yes. becomes a DC thing like 10 years. So they're still fighting over the shit that we built, <laughs> put it that way. And so they're not going to fight about the thing we're building now for another 10 years or maybe five years. So we've got some time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at some point, yes, they will, they will catch up and... But it, yeah. what's, what's fascinating about the conversation, though, is uh, it seems like the crazy thing. Like, no, they'll never weaponize GDPR to go after, like, uh, centralized blockchains. But, like, fuck yes, they are. Like, that, like that's a layup. Yeah. If you don't like a certain industry or, or a certain piece of technology, all you have to do is literally find one instance. That's right. And what also is unique here is that uh, in order to figure out did Facebook do something wrong, right, whatever wrong ends up being, like you essentially have to either have a whistleblower, you have to have somebody who like shows up and is like, I was a Facebook user, this, 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 and this, whatever, like here's the information, or you have to somehow subpoena the information from Facebook. Like it, it's not like – Oh, let me just go on my computer, do a, a block explorer and start, you know, screwing around and then finding something. And then, yep. you know, there you go. <laughs> and yep. obviously this is why law enforcement likes people transacting on an open oh, ledger. They, love that it. they can fucking they love look crypto. at. Uh, but yeah, it feels like this is like such a no brainer that of course they're going to weaponize this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I don't know how much to overstress it. GDPR is real. When you develop product these days, you know, back in the day at Facebook, they thought about it. There was privacy council, but it was kind of like the last check mark before you shipped, right? Now, like you, you didn't want to do something egregious, right? That was obviously in not in the interest of the user, right? Right. right. Now it seems like uh, people are designing products with privacy at the heart exactly. of it. On day one, you don't want to build yourself into a corner where like, oh shit, now we can't comply, we can't ship. It's like building a thing that won't run, mm -hmm. and so it's a like I. I Cannot stress enough to Web3 people, privacy is real. It will come to your house at some point soon. You have to take it seriously. You're not going to just talk your around it. It's like, it's like you know, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen like the XKCD cartoon around like the wrench thing, yeah. where it's like how crypto people think it works. Oh, it's like in crypto itself. It's like, no, 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 no. Here's this little $5 wrench. Just hit the guy until he gives you your password. Guess what? You're dealing with the people with the wrenches and the guns and the, and the jails and all the rest of it. Crypto can only shield you to a certain extent. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that, that, that's going to happen at some point. What else do you think is a threat or in the privacy area? So like GDPR with like just the blockchain being open and can't delete data, all that is one piece of it. Are there other privacy things that you guys are thinking about? No, I mean, I, there's a whole DeFi KYC side of things, right? Like, which I'm somewhat less familiar with in the privacy side. Um, no, I don't, I don't see any deep existential risks. I mean, I, I do think there's going to, there, I mean, there obviously is some like organ rejection around like the culture of crypto and like unfettered freedom and movement that just doesn't jibe with our current globalized world. But everyone knows that. Um, no. I, I do find it absolutely hilarious that everyone's is uh, attacking the thing. And I spend all my time thinking about Bitcoin. Um, but like, it is probably the most American ethos, like based technology yeah, yeah. that we have of just like, you can do whatever you want to do, right. and, and uh, uh, you don't even have to tell people who you are, right? Like, like that to me just screams American ethos of like freedom. Yeah. And yet America seems to be one of the most uh, cautiously abrasive. Like they're not China. Well, then I was going to say they're not, not China. But, <laughs> but they definitely uh, – the default is like we don't like this thing. Yeah. And now there's some education happening and there's some politicians who maybe, you know, are, are kind of on the pro side. But like – it would feel like if they understood it to, you know, the absolute minute details, they would be like, man, we should do everything we can to make this successful. Now there's downside and, and uh, potentially risk some of the, the benefits that they already enjoy. But like, it does feel very weird. Yeah. I mean, there's that viral threat from, uh, who is it? Uh, punk, um, I forget the number actually. 6259 maybe? 6159? Six, yeah, maybe. Um, who said, you know. If I got it wrong, I, I was yeah, talking about somebody else. I'm sure we're going to get pounded <laughs> on it. There's, that's it. We got canceled. We're done because you <laughs> forgot the number. Um, but it's yeah. like you're trying to remember IP addresses rather than human readable <laughs> domains. Like 121.69. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I still remember some of those actually back in the day. Really? They, yeah. Well, because you know you had like Earthlink and you had your stable IP. Yeah. You'd have to enter in the DNS table. It's like a, uh, you ever try to think about how many phone numbers that are in your phone book do you actually know by heart? Oh, God, none at this point. Zero. Like zero. Uh, there are people who like I absolutely should know them and I don't and it's kind of scary right Right. if you're in jail I'm like call your wife it's like uh, have my phone <laughs> okay, exactly uh, I promise I won't go on the internet <laughs> I will not tweet <laughs> I just need the phone <laughs> yeah but getting back to his, his tweet thing it's like his point was like you know crypto is so American in so many ways like if there is a crypto century America should dominate it right because mm -hmm. it's like the most American thing ever um, and I agree it's true right like I mean yeah China just will never accept a, tr a truly crypto reality it's odd that uh, this is a free country, man. <laughs> like that's, we should be able to say that more, right? Around crypto, but uh, yeah, that's weird. This need for control—I don't get it. You know? and, and how much of this is uh, 
a misunderstanding or like lack of education versus like, no, they actually do understand. And I'll, I'll give you a, a two examples. So like Brad Sherman, uh, one of the politicians from California, uh, he was one of the first ones to be like, we should ban uh, Bitcoin and crypto. Like, like get rid of this stuff. It's a threat to the American dollar. And like, I mean, he was just went like full extreme on the, on the other end. And then you have people uh, like you've got uh, Warren Davidson, uh, you've got Senator Lummis uh, up in Wyoming. Uh, you've even seen uh, mayors, uh, you got Suarez, you got governors, like all, all these other people who are like, no, actually like we either want to embrace it or like I'm agnostic. Like I don't, I don't want to ban it, but like uh, I also don't, don't want to run head first. It feels like the Brad Shermans of the world are like uh, very well educated. It's not that he doesn't understand it. It's like almost that he understands it so well that he's trying to play chess like three, four, five steps ahead. And he sounds insane, right? And people are just like, that's stupid. You're just like an old man yelling and screaming. Uh, but it seems like everyone just gets labeled with like, oh, you don't understand. Congress doesn't understand. Politicians don't understand. But like the more I listen to them talk, mm -hmm. like more of them seem to understand than maybe we, they let on. Maybe so. Um yeah, it's unfortunate. I haven't actually followed that politician's uh, trajectory. Um, he, he, uh, his biggest donors are uh, credit card companies. Oh, so well. a lot of people are. Yeah, I like the idea of actually politicians should dress up like NASCAR drivers with like all their donors as like little logos. So every time he goes in front of a camera, he's got a little Visa logo, like he's a fucking point of sale system. That that would be uh, ideal. Do you think I, you think they would change uh, their actions? Oh, of course they would, because <laughs> it would look so ridiculous sitting there like shitting on crypto with like a Visa logo on it, like, a, like a little square checkout. Pad. I've always thought that they should have to take like a, a super elementary test before they go to these hearings. And like, remember the guy who was like, uh, uh, you need to shut down Finsta, like the fake Instagram. Yeah. And they were like, uh, sir, like that's not a yeah. thing, whatever. Like they should have to take like a five question, multiple choice question, uh, test. If you don't get four out of five right, like you're not allowed to question the people. Yeah. Because you just literally don't have the basic understanding of like, what is Instagram? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I learned, so I, I have gone to DC, again, in the context of Lincoln Network and talked to some of these staff. Of, I wouldn't name the staff, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But, you know, people who, senators who make loud pronouncements about the internet. And, you know, they're not as dumb as you might think, right? To be honest, like a lot of their staff, so by the way, DC, so like the figurehead is whoever, but their staff are like 23, yes, right? Yes. And just got out of American University and it's like their first job and they're a staffer and they've been told to go figure out crypto. <laughs> and then like Lincoln Network shows up with like, oh, here's Antonio who came from the industry, did it, yeah. talk to him. And like, yeah, explain to us Web3. <laughs> like, oh, okay, where do I start? And so like, they're not necessarily dumb and they're not necessarily anti, but yeah, I don't know. Somehow between that 23 year old getting the memo and reading on the internet, whatever, and what comes out of the mouth of whoever, Josh Hawley or whatever, um, there's a lot of steps in there. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that politician knows that, you know, he needs to sing for his supper, so to speak, to keep his job. Um, I don't know. I, I think one of the other things that's happened in American life, I love zooming out to 30,000 feet. It's like at some point in the 60s, we decided that we're no longer a frontier society, <laughs> right? What do you mean? Like, so there's this, uh, there's this, famous essay by, I forget his name, written uh, in the early 20th century about the frontier in American life, right? The notion of there being some untrammeled frontier where a man and a woman and a family can go out and create their new reality and stake a new home. And like we had the Homestead Act in Alaska until the 60s and 70s where the government would literally give you land and say, as long as you live there for five years, it's yours, right? Like the United States had that, meant, right? I mean, think about that. When I was buying land up in the Northwest, I was thinking of buying in Alaska. They don't have the Homestead Act anymore, but the state does basically raffle out like land, basically yeah. way cheaper than it should in cost. The 1870s, I'm reading a book right now, and uh, basically as people pushed west, like, you just got to get it put into the land deed, right? That, like, that's yours. That's and, yours. And, uh, yeah, that's how you got it. <laughs> right. I mean, the football team, the Oklahoma Sooners were the ones who got there soon, sooner, who, like, jumped the federal, like, date to actually claim land or whatever, because they were stake jumpers, as they're called. Anyhow, um... At some point in the 60s, after the Apollo program, we decided that's it. We're no longer a frontier society that pushes into the unknown. And everything's about control and safety and security. And I think those things have just gotten worse in time. And uh, I think Web3 is an interesting new frontier. One of the things that draws me to it makes me think of, uh, I had a bit of a bust up with uh, our, our, our friend Keith Raboy and uh, Max Levchin uh, a week ago over the differences between Web2 and Web3. And uh, what, what, what did you say? What did I say? What did I say? I'm such an asshole. What did I say? I didn't try being an asshole, but I, I did say it was a sentiment I actually honestly did feel, okay. which is that web, again, using web three, this kind of hazy term just to refer to this thing, um, feels kind of like what web two felt like 10 years ago, right? Okay. Like when you were walking around South Park in Soma, which now is just empty, by the way, it's like oh, there's the founders of like this weird Airbnb thing and mm -hmm. there's Uber and then there's, there's this part, like there was this thrilling, bracing feeling of like lots of weird shit is going on, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're replacing every service and like it's part of what led to chaos monkeys, right? Where like these chaos monkeys that run around and completely rejigger everything. 
And there's this tremendous feeling of energy and enthusiasm and forward looking. And, and there was a lot of, to be honest, I wouldn't say religiosity, but a lot of ideology around, like things are worth disrupting for the sake of disrupting. And even if it isn't obviously clear why this is better now, it's still worth doing, mm -hmm. right? And somehow Web2, for a bunch of reasons that I can speculate about, just no longer has that feeling. And it's why? like, well, I, I, a lot of it was like the anti-tech turn, I think, of media in 2016 with the Trump election, that there was this tech backlash, which I think is, a lot, is very inventive. If you look at most polls, most Americans like the tech that they use. <laughs> they don't actually hate Facebook. Um, and certainly if you look at Facebook's usage chart, they don't seem to hate it. Um, part of it was, I don't know, maybe something gets tapped out, right? Like, dude, how many services can you put on this phone? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. how many things can I buy on this phone? Like, how many people can I make appear with shit on this phone? At some point, it's like a new user flow, a new sign-in process, a new sharing button. Like, it's all the same shit. Mm -hmm. You need to refactor things. Like, to me, like, literally, I said this in the thread, even if Web3 ends up being, and I, I suspect it will converge to that. Like, yeah, it'll be an interesting new set of infrastructure and like a new way, like it'll enable some new interesting use cases. But to be honest, it could end up being something somewhat similar to Web2, but as long as we get rid of the fan companies, it'll be good, right? Like, because mm -hmm. it's like any company that starts now is literally like a little, a little, a little, you know, a little dwarf, a little miniature person kind of jumping in between the legs of these elephants. And as moment, the moment you get any level of traction, you know, Apple's going to show up and expect it's 30% on the App Store. And by the way, you have to use its ad because they nuked attribution through its ATT thing, fucking it up for everybody else, by the All way. All in the name of privacy. All in the name of Privacy, Pro yeah, privacy. Probably one of the craziest business strategy moves that we've seen in a long time, and it appears to be working, and yep. no one seems to be talking about it outside yep. of like a very small group of people who pay attention to this everything. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say it again, because I say it everywhere. It's like, dude, it's like privacy is one of those things like security. Like if you turn the knob that says privacy, on the other knob, on the other side of the knob, it says competition, <laughs> right? And that, like there are no solutions in this world. There are only trade-offs, right? There is no perfect privacy solution. You have to find a trade-off. And if you can crank up the knob to 11, but that means there's, there's only be two games in town, Google and Apple, and that's it if we go for a max privacy world. So mm -hmm. think about it if you want a max privacy world or not, because that's not going to, I think it's not going to be a good world. But that that's also one of the things, right? That we're in a max privacy world. Like, I had this conversation with uh, the, the Stanford people, Renee and, and Alex, last week at a Lincoln Network event. It's like you realize this regime of like content moderation, combating misinformation, privacy, all that does is like super fucking raise the bar such that only in the Googles and Facebooks can actually comply with it. Can you imagine starting on Instagram now? Impossible. And, 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 and having to field a content moderation team with like the expected standard of everyone feeling nice and cuddly and safe all day? It would be impossible. It's impossible. It would be impossible. There's no yeah. way to do it. Right. Yeah. The, the other, uh, I, I've always thought of this, um, or these are borrowed ideas, uh, Bitcoin was started in a way where no one was paying attention for five, six years right. until like, crypto showed up or, you know, whatever you want to think about it. Uh, now you could never recreate that. Like there's right. too many people, there's literally venture capitalists running around the world, right. Trying to find the next thing, like whatever, like it just would be nearly impossible to do. Um, same thing with a lot of these companies, right. Is yeah. Instagram, nobody cared about content moderation for like <laughs> almost a decade. Right. right. And then all of a sudden it was like, Hey, why is this person on here? Hey, what about this? What about this? And like, you see it now, like uh, we, I mean, this is uh crazy, we had a interview with Andrew Tate in person, live whole thing is up for a whole month, 1.4 million views or so on it. All of a sudden we get an email, take it down by YouTube. Why? Misinformation, no other details, no anything. Uh, I see him saying the same thing on other channels, I, on other videos, like all this stuff. And all I could think to myself was like, who gets to decide that? Right. Yeah. And like, by the way, there's things that you and I probably were tweeting two years ago that like people were like, oh, that sounds crazy. And now they're like, duh, right? Like it, it's all changing. I don't, I don't know. It's just a weird world that we're moving towards. Yeah, misinformation is funny. You know, there's a crack about like, you know, people don't believe in God anymore, but there's certainly a lot of devils. <laughs> 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 and misinformation is like this catch-all. It's like, oh, it's just, it's evil. <laughs> it's, it's just misinformation. I mean, yeah. it, so it sounds bad, right? Like, I don't want to share misinformation. I mean, right? yeah, like, you don't yeah, either. Right. It's like, you, you ever seen the comedian, uh, I think it's Chris Rock, I think does it. Uh, it's either Chris Rock or Cat Williams, can't remember. Uh, he talked about insurgents and war. He's like, the greatest marketing thing ever was we called them insurgents. Like, right. they were like, uh, hey, we're gonna go kill the insurgents. Everyone's like, I'm not an insurgent. I don't know any insurgents. Like, kill them all, right? Right? But if they're like, hey, we're going to go kill humans, you're like, whoa, 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 time out. Like, who, who are they? What'd they do? Like, why are we going to do this? Same thing with misinformation. Like, you yeah. just label it misinformation, and everyone just walks away and says, yeah, those people are bad. Those they people they spread bad. misinformation. They spread misinformation. Yeah, exactly. When you think about the censorship, how much of that is going to come as well? Like, you talk about GDPR and, and like, the privacy. Like, do you think that that— I mean, ideally, right? Like— Will come? Isn't—wasn't it Chris Dixon who said— um, 
can't be evil is better than don't be evil, <laughs> right? And th- mm-hmm. that, you know, don't be evil was obviously Google's mantra for a long time. And obviously, I don't think they're living up to it now. And even they themselves would probably concede that well, they, they don't, don't use that, they that term. They don't even use it right. Anymore. Yeah, that's a good reason why they don't use it anymore. Um, and so if you design systems that are kind of uncensorable, of course, like uncensorable in reality is often not uncensorable in theory, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's. So what, another divide I've seen in society, I've talked to lots of people with weird ideas and you hang out with weirdos long enough, you hear a lot of weird stuff. But um, <laughs> it's interesting. One of the divisions that you see, like I, I, I do think there's this notion in like statistics and machine learning of like latent variables. And what that means is you've got a model that's got like features A, B, and C, and then and they're behaving in weird ways. But in fact, there's this latent variable that is actually the thing driving the phenomenon that are highly correlated and maybe actually lead to A and B, but you're, you're looking at like the wrong thing, mm-hmm. right? Or you're looking at the... It's almost like being in Plato's cave. You're looking at the shadow of reality. You're not looking at the reality. So I think one of the sort of latent variables in society is what is your orientation towards institutions? You're either an institutionalist or you're like an Mm anti-institutionalist. And it doesn't necessarily mean against institutions in general. We're not in an anarchist book collective in Portland or whatever. It just means like the current set of institutions. Do you think there's a a salvageable middle that like we have to preserve? Because you talk to a lot of people who, again, some of them have even like chewed up and spit out by institutions. And you can tell, like, they still believe in them. They just wish they were running them, <laughs> which, yeah, 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 is, which is different yeah. than saying, well, kind of burn it all down. Or actually, I have, like, a completely different institutional model that I actually want to realize. Well, this, this is my problem with, like, the hardcore uh, extreme anarchist view that uh, just naturally shows up with uh, with some of crypto, Bitcoin, whatever, is like, uh, no, we want – some sort of order. Again, we right. can have different order. We can agree on different rules. We can do like all these things and everything. But like, uh, I don't think we want to go back to, again, go to like the 1800s where like literally your defense system was essentially like, could you pull your gun faster than whoever showed up to your house in the middle of the right. night? Right. Like that doesn't seem like a world we want to live in. Uh, and then also like, uh, there's a number of different things that, uh, especially local governments do that, uh, make life easier. Again, you can argue, should they exist? Should they not? Whatever. But like, it does make life easier institutions are the kind of the same thing. Like it goes back to like the Dow thing. Like, okay, we're going to have this thing. We're all going to like work on something, but like there's no organization. There's no anything. Like what do you end up getting? Like, oh, well, we should get sub Dow's. We should get divisions of companies, whatever. Right. And then you get also like Bill Gates. He's the pirate in the garage, but lives long enough. And now like he is the man, right? And everyone yeah. is like this guy, you know, the evil billionaire or whatever. But, by like, way, I think that's a common thing, by the way. I 50 think, years ago, he wasn't. Right, right. I think that's a common thing. It's funny. I So we have job listings that are going to go out that hopefully will be live by the time this episode goes out. <laughs> but one of the taglines is like, you know, uh, c- come be a pirate now that Web 2 is the Navy, <laughs> right? It's kind of a spin on the Steve Jobs line, right? Because, and, and again, getting back to my debate with Keith and Max Levchin and some of these, what I call Web 2 boomers, right? Where it's like, you used to... <laughs> And I'm like, they're same age or even younger but, or older, but it's like, dude, like you used to be the crazy pirate in the garage and now you're like fat and happy and sitting on the top of like the web two pile and you think you still are that rebel, but it's like, no, you're not. Right? And it's like, what I wanted to ask him is like, think about the younger version of you, like literally the, the 18 year old version of you. Are they working at the companies that you're running now? Or are they working mm-hmm. in a completely different ecosystem mm-hmm. where, you know, the, but, the, but I, but I do think that it's, um, it's split. So like I, I I agree with the sentiment. What I would say though is there it's not just exclusively like Bitcoin crypto world is like where all of the quote unquote pirates are going. I think a lot of them are. I talk to I don't know, uh I guess it doesn't sound as weird to tech people, but like the average person, like I talked to a lot of 18 to 22 year olds, but like, yeah, they're super excited about this. Yeah. But you know what else they're really excited about? Like the whole like American dynamism. Are they? Uh, okay, cool. And they want to go work on uh, defense stuff or space or like whatever. Yeah. And like, there's probably two or three other industries if we sat down and like, I really thought about like, hey, where are, are some of these people going? But they're not going to work at Facebook. No. They're not going to work no. at Google. They're not no. going to work at these places. And in some way, the people who are going to work there who are young are like uh, the people who historically would have gone to IBM or right. wherever. It's just like now these new companies are like a little bit shinier, but it's the same thing. Right. And so I do wonder how many – like fintech is really interesting, right? Like fintech, not crypto stuff. Is that still seen as like cutting edge or are young people saying, I don't want to go work at another – banking, you know, like legacy banking type uh, thing. I don't care if it has a digital kind of skin around it or are they saying, no, like, fuck it, I'm going to go do the crazy DeFi thing that like, you know, has a 1% chance of working. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, obviously I'm not in that age bracket, but I would speculate that they're probably not, <laughs> they're not going. I mean, I, I don't think, 
I don't think the world's most aggressive, ambitious talent is going into fan companies. No, I, that is not my vibe. Yeah. Although, I, I, but I think most venture capitalists would agree with that. Yeah. W- why? They, why did they push back? What they well, because because Web two has become the man, right? Like I often think of. Um, John Perry Barlow, uh, one of the founders of EFF back in the day, um, back when it was EFF and not what it is today, um, wrote, uh, <laughs> EFF has kind of gone the way of ACLU. It's like, wait, <laughs> you used to defend all these crazy people in the name of free speech, and now you're actually part of the man. And so, like, anyhow, but back in the day, right, when EFF was a thing, he wrote this famous cyberspace manifesto that I think was very impactful. I mean, even earlier than me, but it was written in the 90s. Um, and, you know, he railed against these uh, weary giants of flesh and steel, right, of like the industrial world. And that cyberspace and tech was going to be the antithesis of that. It's going to be the reaction against that. Like they're the Navy, we're the pirates, and we're this new world. And the reality is that companies like Facebook and Google have become the weary giants of not necessarily flesh and steel, but whatever. Um, and they've, they've become part of that Borg. They're no longer the response to the Borg. They're part of it. And, you know. Will that happen at crypto? Uh, at some point, I mean, if, that's it, probably, if it lives long enough, that's probably the natural life cycle of everything. Yeah. Um, but that's a long way. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're a long way to go year, from 30, 40 years, 30, 40 whatever. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably a long way. Yeah. I, I do think a lot about, um, in some ways, this specific industry has retaught so much about economics, technology, but also just like, how did America become America? Right, like you go back and you read and you're like, oh wow, a like, tax revolt, <laughs> like yeah, like oh shit, right, like wow, okay, and then like oh, uh, I don't know, uh, the Federalist Papers, like you go and you like read it and you're like, hmm, published geez. anonymously, they're all anonymous share posters. All the founding fathers were anonymous accounts. They'd all get content moderated now. I wasn't gonna go down that rabbit hole, but like again, it goes back to if you really George the Third would have worked at Facebook. No, I'm joking. <laughs> if you really start to look at yeah. a lot of American history, like. There are things that I think today's uh, kind of pro-America elite incumbent uh, believes that is in direct violation yes. of kind of the original ideals of uh, yes. what America uh, was supposed to be. And I would argue still in many places is. Yeah. But that bifurcation is wild because like, go read the documents, go do yeah. the work. It, it's just like, no, I take this idea. Now I have a different idea of where we should go. Yeah, no, I mean, there were radical ideas. Um, I read a piece for Wired in like 2017 that was like argued, you know, we're not – this change in model of journalism from like fact-checked reportage coming from the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude, the Founding Fathers didn't live like that at all. For, for starters- They all had newspapers. They, like all had newspapers. <laughs> they all had newspapers. They're all pamphleteers. I forget it was either John or Sam Adams that he, he was actually at the Boston Tea Party, like literally throwing the teeth, and then he reported about it as if he wasn't there. He totally lied about it. <laughs> and then he held the meeting for it in his office, in the printer's office before it actually happened. He was completely engaged. There was no neutrality. There was no anything, right? It was like a total joke. Benjamin Franklin wrote at least whatever it was, 10 or 15 different pen names. Um, they all attacked that, each other. I, I did read that recently, actually. Yeah. And like, that is wild. Yeah. That ben Franklin literally <laughs> had, like, it's kind of like having a message board and having a bunch of pseudonyms and then just talking to, Talk each, to other. each other. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Until all of a sudden, like, oh, shit, there's a community. <laughs> Which, by the way, a lot of crypto companies are doing as well. And, and uh, also, if you kind of think about it, like, uh, there's nothing new. Like, this is all human nature shit. Like, how do you yeah. solve like, the cold start problem in, you know, 1850? Like, I don't know. Just fucking just get out my uh, feather and just start writing from different names. And next thing you know, people will come show up. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think we were maybe a bolder people back then. We were willing to put up with just confronting. I don't know. It, it's hard to say. On the one hand, I think one of the bad things about social media is that you're constantly forced to defend, like, your basic moral foundations. Like, it's like you go to Twitter and it's like getting kicked in the face, right? And it's like I've gotten gotten used to it a little bit, and we probably both have, but it kind of sucks. Like, your average normal person would never do this, right? And, like, at some point it's like – you know, it's like running a, a company, right? If you have debates about foundational everything in a company, your company goes nowhere. Like, there's some things you have to say, look, these things are beyond debate. We're just not going to address these things anymore. That's it. We talk about these things, which is where we think the alpha is. Um, and somehow, yeah, we've lost it as a society. It's weird because on the one hand, they put up with an enormous amount of disagreement. Like, everyone thinks, oh, everyone just agreed on everything. But it's like, are you kidding? Absolutely not. I mean, literally, oh. we, we had a sitting vice president. <laughs> fucking American revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, Aaron Burr, like, literally a sitting vice president shot a former secretary of the treasury and then just went back to work as if nothing had happened. Right? <laughs> he like laid low in Georgia for a while and they just went back and said, well, sorry. Oops. <laughs> I killed Alexander Madison. Uh, Hamilton. Sorry. And it's, um, yeah. So, but it, yeah. Do, do you feel like... Uh, Things like Substack and, and kind of like the rise oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. the individual uh, whatever. Like, 
what is going to be the impact? Is it just like, no, we have coexistence. There's like, uh, kind of like college. Everyone's like, oh, let's disrupt college. And it's like, dude, Harvard's not going anywhere, right? I don't care what you say, Harvard, Yale, MIT, whatever. And so like, sure, you might disrupt like the uh, third or second tier, you yeah. know, colleges. Same thing here with media is like, you'll get the independent voices and you'll get the concentration of like two to four really big organizations. They survive and everyone yeah. else is fucked. Yeah, I mean, when you, yeah, when I've had this debate about institutionalists versus anti-institutionalists with institutionalists, they're like, okay, Mr. Anarchist, so what are you going to replace the New York Times with, <laughs> right? Like, I still need to know what's going on in the world. And it's a good point, right? Like, again, obviously, I'm on Substack. They've, they've done very well by me. Like, I'm very pro the company. I know the founders. You know, that said, are they going to fill the whole of conventional media fully? Not necessarily. I don't know if they want to, right? Like, they probably don't want to. Yeah. I've I mean, never specifically asked them that, but like, I... I get the sense that they're just like, no, we just want individual people to write, and uh, there's a lot of value to that. I, I mean, look, the MSM does do some good. Like, occasionally you'll read a piece in The Atlantic or The New York Times, like, wow, that was actually pretty good. Like, I remember, like, the Afghanistan pullout, which was a total disaster, and when they, like, vaporized an entire family and killed a bunch of people, which no one had any accountability for, which was a complete you know, disgrace. Uh, the New York Times actually did this amazing reporting, and like, okay, no, here's the shot, here's the thing, here's where it happened. We interviewed the family. It's like, oh, this felt like an actual, like, on the ground report. It was like Clarissa Ward, uh, the CNN uh, journalist. She's on the who, ground, right. and uh, she's surrounded by Taliban members, right? right? And she's like reporting, and and you could tell you're like, yo, that's fucking dangerous as shit, <laughs> right? And and I remember people just like taking pictures, being like, this woman is risking her life to tell this story right, right. now, and like, I don't care what you think about that yeah. organization or whatever. You just got to tip your hat and say, hey, that woman's doing work that is important right. and uh, should be blast it out by everyone possible right. uh, because there's not very, very many people willing to go do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, of course, the counter argument is like, well, you know, like in Ukraine, they use Telegram a lot. Like when I was in Ukraine, I was just like, listen to like, you see a lot of these videos come along. So you have the close reward experience. You don't feel like it's this disembodied voice telling you a coherent narrative. It's like this blurry video of some weird shit that happened in some random town. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but <sighs> hard to say, hard to say, right? Because... Yeah, I mean, if we return to that previous journalistic model of basically advocacy journalism, things are very different, right? The notion of there being some objective truth in a national narrative kind of goes away and, and things get very fragmented. And again, to the extent that like your regional newspaper had a, like I'm sure Southern newspapers were very different than Northern newspapers and like the Miami Herald in the 80s was very different than the New York Times, the LA Times, but there was still a cohesion around it and like your area of concern was relatively limited. Mm -hmm. And now that your area of concern is global, it's odd that we don't actually have a global reality in which to discuss it. And I think that's part of what you see when like red and blue, just to give them two broad labels for debating online, they're talking about different realities, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the clearest proof of that. And I think this started in like the Beto Cruz race. I don't know if it started, but it, at least I noticed it is when like, Remember what, I forget which, <laughs> it's funny, they blurred in my mind, I forget which was which, but like literally one's like actual ad was the attack ad for the other side. <laughs> like literally it's like, our moral foundations are so different. What you consider to be like the summum bonum, like political good mm -hmm. is this person's absolute evil. And like literally he just ran like the Beto ad is like, this is what Beto is. Like that's my, my attack ad is his ad. That's how different we are. Um, <laughs> that seems untenable. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, I do believe that uh, American politics is on the precipice of absolute. Uh, full plunge into like what I call meme warfare. So like yeah. everything that we've seen so far has been like the extremes of kind of like a, a web two fiat world or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think that Trump was the first to kind of break. Uh, he was selling the hats and he was, you know, saying all the bombastic shit and, and uh, the debates, he was uh, more so an entertainer uh, right. to some degree. And, and, and like, you could start to see it happening. Yeah. Uh, but I think within the next two to three presidential elections, we're just going to see a level of, uh, in the trenches, internet native, like warfare, yeah. uh, and, and like information, yeah. uh, kind of battle that will blow the 2015 versions of ourselves out of the right, water definitely. and be like, how is this happening? Yeah. And true. part of what I think is fascinating about it is like, so like you, that is pretty simple, but I think a lot about like Coinbase ran that, uh, super, uh, kind of, uh, genius ad where they just had the uh, QR, QR code, code bouncing yeah, around. Yeah. Like what is the political equivalent of that? And like, somebody's going to figure out what it is and they're going to start doing that stuff. And then you're going to see all the stuff on Twitter. And what you realize in some ways, like now everyone's an actor, like, like yeah. everyone on the internet has yeah. some, something when the politicians like figure out the game, we're going to want to get off the internet. Like, it, like, it's going to get to the point where we're just like, holy shit. 
You yeah, know that I mean that, that's a deep thing. So a couple couple of reactions to that. One to steel man it for a second, right? It might be a good thing that like we're never gonna have a civil war because the civil war is gonna be on Twitter. <laughs> and to be honest, we're all like too fat and happy and lazy to actually like run a mile and fire a rifle anymore. Mm-hmm. Like Antietam is not happening ever again, right? And, and so it's gonna be like it's gonna be like Twitter Antietam, which obviously has a lower body count. Um, so maybe arguably it's it's a good thing. Um, that we're creating this virtual reality, although it means that I think when reality does intrude in the form of pandemic or the Ukraine war, we just like can't grok. Like we just don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And, and again, this full on meltdown. R- right, right, right. And again, I think it's real. Like current thing theory is real, and that there is like this pseudo event thing. On the other hand, if you think everything is a current thing, then reality becomes. But you know, I, I don't know if you know the thinker Bruno Massais. He's this Portuguese. Um, he wrote an interview. I, I interviewed him on my podcast a couple years ago. He, he wrote a book uh, called uh, "History Has Begun," and it's it's. The thought is that the U.S. has decided to wrap itself inside virtual mean warfare, basically what you're saying, and make reality kind of optional. But then, of course, when reality becomes non-optional, the problems begin, like with the pandemic or war. So, again, I, I, I suspect you're right. Um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, the other thing I would say, I lost my train of thought. What was the other thing? Um, anyhow, uh, but, yeah, I, I agree with you that um, in some sense that's, uh, that's going to be the problem. Yeah. yeah. The, the piece uh, that I think is concerning about it is, like, right now all the politicians are, like, a gazillion years old and like they use flip phones and don't have email or like, well, you know, whatever, like oh, we like to like make fun of them. Uh, what happens when like the 30 year olds are uh, rampant and they're now like 40 or 50 and they understand the internet really well? Um, because I actually think that a lot of times what we're seeing, so like I have this theory that like Trump and AOC are the same person, right? Right. Like they both understand the internet. They understand how to entertain. They understand how to get attention yeah. and all stuff. Uh, and um, I had uh, Mike Solana uh, on and we were talking about uh, the, arrest i'll put that in air quotes of the congress people did you see this oh the business of yeah yeah yeah. and they like they like had their hands behind their back but they weren't arrested oh but they were i arrested. remembered okay i remember what i was thinking sorry but yeah no so okay sorry um so i get excited as you can tell case on the pump um that, that's why i'm excited talking. <laughs> <laughs> there is this really overlooked and underrated book uh called mediated by an anthropologist named thomas uh kind of a weird last name De- Tita is his last name and um came out in like the early aughts, kind of ignored now. Um, and he, he just talks about exactly what you just said, that everyone being an actor. The thought of being mediated is a weird thought. And we've all taken it as normal, mm-hmm. but it's strange. And it's only when you pull yourself out of the matrix, again, to kind of red pill yourself, that you sort of, that you sort of realize it. Um, the example he cites, uh, which is interesting, I mean, it's a couple of examples. One is, you notice that like, back in the day, nobody asked themselves the question, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor, right? Because the notion of you almost in a phantom limb way, experiencing something at a distance and your personal experience of being a thing wasn't a thing yet. People heard about Pearl Harbor because they literally was like a rumor on a radio two days later. Like it was not a thing they directly witnessed. However, the JFK shooting was the first time, similar to the 9-11 thing. It's like, where were you when that happened? Because it was this feeling of, like you saw the towers go down or you saw JFK get shot and you felt you were sort of physically enmeshed in it even though you weren't, mm-hmm. right? So something has happened there. The other example he cited, which is interesting, um, he was at one of these act. I guess he was interested in acting when he was younger. One of these acting studios in New York. Uh, one of these method acting things in which you've probably never done acting or stand up. Neither have I. <laughs> I'd be too embarrassed. What are you talking about? We're doing stand up right now. Uh, no, well, I, yeah, I know, <laughs> but unfortunately, I have to do it. But um, but he's like, you know, it's one of these things where they give you an assignment, like, oh, you've just been shot, or you just heard that your uncle died, mm-hmm. and then you're supposed to channel the emotion and do it. And like, literally, as I understand it, everybody in the acting school starts acting as if their uncle just died, right? Which sounds very weird and fake, but I guess in acting, that's what you have to do. Mm-hmm. And so, anyhow. It was, uh, I guess, um, what, uh, November 22nd, 1962 or 61 or whatever it was. And someone opens the door and says, the president has been shot. And everyone starts acting with the grief of it, right, for like 10 minutes. And the guy comes in and is like, no, 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 the president actually got, like, he got shot right now. Like, it's on TV. And then everyone just, like, freaked out because they realized they were supposed to be acting about the thing. But then they had the real flood of emotions of actually being the thing. And the guy said he was so freaked out about it, he, like, ran out the room and never did acting again. Because it was such, he realized that the media had made us all actors. We're all kind of on TV all the time, right? Whether it be for like a selfie or a TikTok or this podcast or whatever. And it's, it's a very different mode to be the real you and act in a very unselfconscious way versus the thought that there's the external other looking in that there is this fourth wall that you're addressing all the time. Yeah. There's a very different reference frames and humanity didn't used to think they were on stage all the time. I, yet um, now we do. I, I see the biggest place is the self-censorship. Like, yes, Exactly. It happens to all of us. Yeah. We're all uh, victims of it. Uh, I, I've been talking to a couple of people, uh, mutual friends of yours and I's, that uh, it's like becoming so prevalent where we've even in this podcast probably multiple times said like, oh, I, I didn't say this, or I was going to tweet it, but then right. I didn't, or, right. uh, you know, can I add an endless steer away from this or whatever? And like, it's not necessarily like 
quote unquote bad, like in the sense of, oh, if you would have said it, it's just like, I don't want to deal with the headache of that. I don't want to actually have right, to exactly. defend uh, why I believe something. And so self-censorship uh, is like a huge fucking problem that is only going to yeah. get worse and worse over time to the point where like, does 90% of the society just say the same things over and over again? Not because they actually believe it, but just right. because they just don't want to deal with it. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all about like Havel's greengrocer thing in which for those who aren't familiar with it, um, I think it was Havel, Buckle of Havel, the Czech president mm -hmm. or, or anyhow, it was, it was an essay about a greengrocer who basically hangs a sign with solidarity for whatever the communist cause was. Not because he deeply cared about it, he just didn't want to deal with the hassle. Um, speaking of communists, you know who's really good at the self censorship uh, people who live in dictatorships. So uh, one of the stories I did for Wired, actual reported story, was in Cuba. So I went to Cuba. Uh, as you might know, Miami Cubans typically don't tend to go back, by and large, uh, unless they have family there or something. But I went back for the sake of Wired Magazine in 2017 to talk about Cuban internet, which is a whole other story, how they get internet and mostly don't get internet. Um, but one thing, I was, I was in Havana in El Vidal, which is kind of like a nice part. And there's, you know, there's kind of a media, very small media and tech scene there. And there's just starting to be like bloggers and, you know, the equivalent of, you know, Matty Glacius, a draw random example of people who mm -hmm. have like an online presence. And they sort of do reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Which again, in Cuba is big news because officially you can't do journalism. You have to be part of the guild and mm -hmm. it's super censored. And I was sitting in a cafe, like a reasonably fancy cafe, and the guy was going on about how he had done reporting from the eastern part of the country. There had recently been a hurricane. The government's response was obviously terrible because the government's kind of incompetent. Shocking. It's sh shocking. But of course, saying that is like, you can't say it in public. And so, you know, I was trying to get at the guy. I was interviewing for the piece. It's like, so what do you, you know, what do you hope to get out of it by reporting on this thing? It's like, well, um, you know, by, by highlighting the government's, you know, lack of, of response to it, we hope to impact, um, you know, the, the Cuban democracy and the Cuban election. And I'm like, and of course, I did not self-censor because I had not been raised inside a tyranny. It's like, what are you talking about? Cuba isn't a democracy. This is, this is tyranny. And I, I just blurted it out in the cafe and everyone just stops and stares at me. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's as if I had like ripped a fart in the elevator and everyone just like pretends it didn't happen. And the guy just kept on talking as if I hadn't said anything. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, I'm like, oh fuck, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot. This is not how this works here. I have to like shut the fuck up. And then you realize as I got there and I hated the place, it was terrible. I, it's, I, I mean, the Cubans are great, but the, the situation is terrible. I don't understand how a tourist go there unless you're a total moron and like just shield yourself from the reality of what's there because everyone is living a lie right like when you in a dictatorship everyone lives a lie there is no truth right yeah. and like the sort of lie and world of lies i tell you is different than the world i lies i tell somebody else and then somebody else and there's these running realities you have to remember it all and keep it all straight in your head to make sure that you don't step on the landmine in fact one of my sources who I was pretty open with, and I was reporting a piece. Like, I didn't lie to them. The piece came out, and I wasn't that anti-government, but I, you know, I said, this is what it is. Uh, they had to, like, denounce me on a Facebook post, and they said, oh, I had no idea that when this journalist, I'd work with them and gave them a quote that this would happen, and so they had to, like, denounce me because I had, like, violated, like, the, the, the matrix of lies that is living in Cuba. And so that's the reality. And again, we're not, this isn't Cuba by any stretch, but it's kind of a taste of that feeling of, oh, I have to worry about what I say, and... Yeah. Have you ever seen the Vice documentary with uh, Dennis Rodman in North Korea? <laughs> I mean, no, I but it sounds pretty lit. I yeah. want to see so it. <laughs> Dennis Rodman goes to North Korea. I'm pretty sure it's Vice does it. Uh, and this is like when Vice was like real Vice, not like corporate uh, Vice. Um, and in it, I just remember this one scene where uh, they walk into a computer lab and uh, they have a bunch of people on the computers and they're like – but nothing's happening on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like, they like call it out. I can't remember if Rodman says it or like the, the, you know, voiceover or whatever. But like, it is like very obvious that like they are trying to put forward a view that right. like we have the internet. Right. And it's like, let's put some people into a computer, but it almost looks like they don't know how to use the computers. Right. And they're just like doing this action. And so that's kind of how I think of some of these places of yeah. just like, yeah, it's a play. And by the way, like if you were that person ordered to go do that, like you go and you do it, right? Do like, it. of course I want to be a good soldier. Like, you know, let me just type away on the computer and not, it's not even turned on. Right. Because and, if you, because if you don't, you're not going to get your ration card. If you don't, you might lose your job. Not that anyone ever loses their job in America for what they thought or wrote. No, that never happens. Yeah. <laughs> that is, is a, a great country. place. <laughs> that is a great place no. to end this. <laughs> I will let everyone use their imagination on that. Uh, go to Wikipedia. Um, where, where can we find people to find you on the internet or find out more about Spindle? Yeah, so I spend way too much time on Twitter, as, as, as we all do. Uh, Antonio GM at Twitter. 
Um, I've got a Substack at thepullrequest.com. And then, it's fantastic. Yeah. Highly suggest people. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, the company, Spindle, without the E, with the E was too expensive. I don't want <laughs> I was like, I was going to pay a Tesla three for a fucking domain. No way. We're dropping the E, and now it sounds like a German metal band. I might even add the umlaut to have the <laughs> motorhead effect. Uh, but in any case, it's Spindle without the E dot XYZ is where it's at. Awesome. Listen, thank you so much. I could talk to you literally forever. <laughs> uh, hopefully we both don't get canceled uh, for the, like the 19th time, but uh, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll do it again in the future. Okay. Thanks, Pump.